Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming today. Um, welcome to our new hearing room. I think that's our third event here. Uh, I thought I'd try uh, to go a little Today Show style with uh, open windows. So if we get any protesters or uh, obscene uh, gestures, we'll close them. But we'll uh, let the light in for right now. This is a, this is a new transparency. Oh, this, yeah, yeah. I expect none of the panelists to make obscene gestures. Um, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the third uh, CFTC Technology Advisory Committee. As you know, this meeting was originally scheduled for January 27th. However, the morning of the 26th, Washington was uh, in the crosshairs of another winter storm. Not like New York, but it's tough for us. I realize that while many of you... Uh, could not get here, uh, or could get here, the odds of getting out even just a few hours later would have been slim to none if we received any accumulation whatsoever. So in the in interest of everybody's schedules and obviously in your safety, we uh, postponed the meeting. This is a good thing because the storm arrived just as the government officials directed everyone to leave early. This paralyzed the city and uh, commutes that normally take an hour took 10, 12, 14 hours. The region appeared to be unprepared for the storm but that was not the case. The problem was the snow fell at an alarmingly fast rate, but, not, but by not coordinating the efforts, uh, area employers created a rush hour during the height of the snowfall, and so we were a victim of uh, speed and a failure to coordinate. And speed and coordination dominated our first two committee meetings, uh, and we'll as we explored computerized trading and high-frequency uh, trading and the, uh, the results of the May 6, uh, 2010 events. Today we're going to take our first shot at tying all of this together in, an interest in the interest of preparing for the new regulatory world, which is dominated by high speed and demands a coordinated approach. To begin, we'll have Harry Hild, our senior economist in the Commission's Market Surveillance Group, who provided some background on the current role of electronic trading and the, and the use of stop logic functionalities on designated contract markets. On May 6th, the deployment of one such functionality was critical to stopping the cascading of prices in the futures markets. As we explore our options, we should never lose sight of what is already proven to work, but we should always be mindful of the potential for improvement. Our first panel will be, will be a discussion of pre-trade functionality subcommittee report on the recommendations of the pre-trade practices and trading firms clearing and exchanges involved in direct market access. Now, uh, Dr. Gorham put this uh, proposal together with the support of the subcommittee members. I understand we tried to, we, we thought we circulated it, uh, and I understand that many of you did not receive many of the handouts for today's hearing, so I'm, I'm very sorry for that, and uh, they are all in your booklets here, um, and I, obviously I would have preferred that you had, had the opportunity to review the, the, the subcommittee report beforehand, but uh, we do have Dr. Gorham here. He will present on that, so we'll be all, all better informed for that. Anyway, this, the, uh, the subcommittee drew on the existing work of the FIA and the CFTC-SEC Joint Advisory Committee uh, regarding the events of May 6th. The PFS can, re, uh, can serve as the foundation for our future proposed rules concerning testing and supervision requirements related to algorithmic trading. The PFS members who contributed, to this, who contributed their experience and expertise in drafting the report include Chuck Whitman, Chuck Weiss, Gary DeWall, and Brian Durkin. By raising the standards and establishing best practices, we can ensure that all participants are treated equally and ensure that the markets are protected from untested algorithms that could undermine well-functioning markets. In addition to discussing the PFS report during the first panel, Nick Garrow, head of uh, electronic trading at New Edge Group, will lead a discussion on the technological applications needed to implement the PFS re recommendations. I think you'll be fascinated to learn about the, the opportunities and challenges facing the market. Our second panel will focus on a different kind of speed and coordination, the speed which we can build and connect the technological infrastructures underlying the trade execution, processing, and record management requirements under the Dodd-Frank Act. I know I say this often, but I continue to believe we, we must be realistic about the technological, budgetary, and infrastructure challenges ahead and work to facilitate coordination of this infrastructure that sets reasonable time frames uh, to accomplish it. I'm interested to hear from the speakers and listen to the debate. Our, this is our first attempt to attap, uh, tackle the technological integration challenges and, uh, and to get your uh, input on this. 
Presentations uh, will include uh, a discussion of interconnection and execution of swaps by Saperna Vedbrad of BlackRock, a discussion of the estimated cost and required investments led by the TAB Group CEO and founder, Larry Tab, and a discussion of the fe feasibility and proposed uni universal identifiers and supporting data reporting requirements uh, led by Marisol Colazoa of DTCC. Our third and final panel has been uh, intentionally left open for discussion. This is your time to raise uh, issues and provide comments. Uh, I think the second panel should provide us some interesting options and challenges, and, and I'd really like to just facilitate that with uh, discussion of what you see in the market uh, and, and your thoughts on that. I would obviously like to thank my fellow commissioners for their participation and would like to welcome our committee members and guest presenters. All of you ta have taken time out of your busy schedules to participate and contribute to the discussion today, and we greatly appreciate that. Um, I'm going to turn to the commissioners for some comments, and then we'll go to the opening panels. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Commissioner O'Malley, for chairing uh, not only today's meeting, but the whole advisory committee and, and bringing forward this group with this recommendations. I also want to thank my fellow commissioners and the dedicated staff of the CFTC for all their hard work on <coughs> Dodd-Frank implementation. Uh, lastly, I want to thank the members of this committee um, for participating, specifically the recommendations, the report of the pre-trade functionality subcommittee, if I mouthful. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the presentations we're going to have on the second panel as well on implementation issues uh, that are so critical. Um, as uh, Commissioner Malia mentioned, the joint uh, CFTC-SEC Advisory Committee, which met, uh, I guess it was about two weeks ago on February 18th, uh, addressed some similar uh, issues with regard to advanced technology and the advances and some of the lessons out of May 6th. And as we... Um, have witnessed uh, in the past technology changes, whether it was in the 19th century when we first had the ticker tape or the earlier 20th century, I believe it was in 1929 when this uh, newer invention called telephones was allowed on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and there was a actually a consolidated uh, instantaneous bid and offer price uh, brought together by telephones in 1929. So, we now regulate a futures marketplace that's approximately 90 percent electronically traded. Um, and uh, the advisory committee uh, made recommendations in this context. Those recommendations include cross-market circuit breakers, pre-trade risk safeguards, which I know that uh, the subcommittee is also looking at, um, and other ways of testing for risk management controls and supervisory requirements. And I join uh, uh, Commissioner O'Malley and that uh, we've actually directed staff to come up with some recommendations, hopefully based on what your input today, based on the public's feedback, based on the Joint Advisory Committee on supervision and testing. In terms of the uh, uh, report itself, uh, I look forward to hearing uh, your thoughts about uh, how clearinghouses, trading firms, and exchanges can address themselves to pre-trade risk safeguards. And I know that you've addressed uh, quantity limits and price collars and throttles, intraday position limits and, and the like. And all of that is going to be very helpful for us to learn from you on. Um, before I close, I do want to say something briefly about our resource needs here at the CFTC. To fulfill our statutory responsibilities to continue to oversee the markets, the futures markets that we oversee, as well as take on the new responsibility in the swaps marketplace, the CFTC does require adequate funding. And I believe now is the time to invest in the oversight of the derivatives markets, both futures and swaps, for our key commodities, whether that be agricultural energy or metals, being the physicals or the financial products that are, are so significant in our economy. And of course, you know the statistics. I mean, we've been regulating a market that's about $40 trillion of notional size, and the swap market's about seven times that size, or about $300 trillion. And our current funding, approximately $168, $169 million. The agency is small compared to the industry we regulate by any measure. Now, our resources are primarily staff and technology. We currently have about 676 staff. Uh, they're experienced, they're thoughtful, they're hardworking, uh, but they also need technology. We spend about 18% of our budget as of last year's numbers on technology. 
and we need to make further investments in technology to efficiently oversee both the futures and swaps market. And I think it's only through that investment that we can adequately oversee a market that has this breadth, this size uh, that we have. Now, in fiscal 2011, you know, we're faced with the challenge that we're currently under a continuing resolution. That means we're funded where we were uh, last year. And unfortunately, we've had to make some uh, hard choices, ones that I don't believe are in the uh, great benefit of, of our mission going forward to make cuts. Uh, so I might not be traveling to Boca, as, as I was asked earlier. Uh, but the more serious cuts are how do we do technology? And we have cut back on that. And I don't think that's good for the long term. But it's, it's, we don't have any grant money. We don't have any money that really goes outside. So we need both technology and we need people. Uh, we need the staff, obviously, to process registration applications and conduct surveillance and rule enforcement, investigate fraud and the like that computers alone can't do. Uh, but we do need the technology. The President's 2011 budget had an increase for both staff and technology. But on a percentage basis, it was far more for technology. Uh, the 2012 budget is a 45 percent increase in staff, but over 100 percent increase in technology. So it's, it's both. Both are critical uh, to, for the CFTC to be a cop on the beat, to ensure that markets for commodities, futures, swaps are protected and are transparent. We, we, I think we need both. Um, again, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, uh, Commissioner O'Malley for letting me say a little bit on resources as well. Commissioner Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I want to thank you for holding this uh, Technology Advisory Committee. Uh, during my tenure on the Commission, I observed firsthand the migration of trading from PIT to electronic platforms, the introduction of high frequency trading, and the growing significance of co-location. I have marveled at the industry's technological advances while despairing over the Commission's inability to keep pace. I am more convinced than ever that unless the CFTC has a firm grasp on the technology advances being made in the world of derivatives trading, we will be woefully unprepared to meet the agency's mission after implementing the Dodd-Frank Act. In order to adequately meet our regulatory mandates, the Commission must have the technology knowledge to understand what traders are doing and the resources to purchase and manage systems that will allow us to perform the necessary surveillance and oversight of the markets we regulate. I look forward to hearing the recommendations from the TAC and the subtask force on how the industry can help the Commission fulfill its regulatory mandates in this rapidly changing technological environment. With the help of Chairman O'Malley and the TAC, I have no doubt that the Commission will know what we need to do to complete the mission before it. Unfortunately, due to the budget crisis facing the CFTC, I do not believe that we will have the necessary fiscal resources to meet the technological demands that face this agency. Many of the Dodd-Frank mandates are techn technologically intense, including data record keeping and reporting, real-time reporting, the oversight of swap data repositories, and swap execution facilities. Each of these areas will undoubtedly require greater understanding of and reliance on technology. However, without adequate funding for technology, the Commission will be forced to rely on the SROs and the industry in general to perform some of these functions. Now, to some, this may sound like putting the proverbial fox in the hen house. I believe that the recommendations of the TAC indicates that there is an industry-wide consistency that uniform adherence to standards is necessary. Unfortunately, there will be those who will try to game the system. In my opinion, it's my opinion that the recruitment, retention, and training of our workforce to monitor the industry's compliance is of paramount importance. I look forward to today's discussion and I'd like to thank our panelists for their presentation and extend a special thank thanks to all the members of the Technology Advisory Committee who will help the CFTC as we try to understand the impact that technology is having on our market. Once again, Chairman O'Malley, I'd like to thank you and your staff for this meeting today. Commissioner Summers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
And thank you all for being here today and for the time that you dedicate to these type of advisory committees for the commission, um, which are very helpful uh, to all of us as we struggle with some of these important issues. Um, as many of you in the room know, I've worked on these issues for approximately 16 years, and some of the issues that we deal with never change. They're the same issues that we have every year, such as uh, our resource issue <clears throat> seems to uh, really never go away. We, we always struggle with having the adequate resources that we need here at this commission. Um, and some things do change as, as the futures industry has evolved more than I would have ever imagined when I started working in this industry. The, the particular issues that we're dealing with today um, on direct market access, pre-trade functionality, have changed dramatically just in the almost four years that I've been here at the Commission. So I think today is, is uh, very appropriate for us to be talking about the changes um, and the way the industry is dealing with many of these issues and want to thank you for bringing these issues to us today and for your leadership um, <clears throat> on the TAC committee. And thank you to all of the presenters that are here today um, uh, that are not part of the TAC committee, but thank you all for your time and, and dedication to these issues. Commissioner Chilton. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me, Commissioner Amalia? We can. Far away. Great. Great. Thanks. Uh, and thanks for everybody's participation. And uh, thank you particularly to uh, Commissioner Amalia for his commitment and support for technology and everything we need to be doing at this, the CFTC. Uh, I've been calling, and I did last week, so I hope my colleagues will bear with me, but I know you all weren't there, members of TAC, but I've been calling HFT uh, traders, cheetah traders, and that's not cheetah with a Boston accent, it's cheetah is in fast, the fastest land mammal. And my concern is that, you know, we, at such an incredible speed that we need to keep up. And as my colleagues have said, I, I don't think there's any way we can keep up with the budget circumstance that we're enduring right now and that we were, will potentially be faced with in the future. Uh, I just think we can't keep up with the, the cheetahs, full stop. Um, there's a couple of things that I've, I've said I think we need to be looking at and, and potentially doing. One is uh, some sort of basic testing regime before cheetah trading programs go live. Um, I'm not saying that the CFTC should do this. We clearly don't have the expertise. Uh, but perhaps the exchanges and their testing environment, perhaps NFA. And I'm not talking about some exhausted, uh, exhaustive testing regime that would – uh, learn the fundamentals of all the ALGO and HFT trades, but some sort of basic, maybe like a Jiffy Lube 10 point sort of checklist to make sure that when these things start operating in the markets, they operate efficiently and effectively and they don't royal markets. Uh, the second thing is uh, I think we need some sort of uh, fine tune uh, of exchange control. And the, the tax subcommittee talked about this a little bit. Uh, a lot, actually, the limit ups and limit down, the circuit breakers, and I very much appreciate that work. And the third thing, which the, the subcommittee also talked about, is those uh, pre-trade prudential uh, firm control. Um, and so I look forward to talking uh, about these things specifically. I also read in the last couple of days, and perhaps everybody else read this uh, when it came out, but there was a very interesting study that was out in November, end of November, uh, by uh, Cartea and Palava. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's something that shed light on, on different aspects of how the cheetah traders are doing things. It's not just that they're fast. It's what they do in the markets. And they gave four different examples, three of which apply to our markets. One is really just a securities uh, model of what they're doing in the markets. And, and it is more than just being quick to the trade. And so uh, to the extent that we have time, Commissioner O'Malley, I'll be asking some questions about that too. Uh, thank you again, and thank you for your staff, Commissioner O'Malley, for setting this up. Thank you. Um, let's go with um, Harry Hild with the, uh, he's a senior economist at the Division of Market Oversight here and advises on policy on both agriculture and financial futures. 
He's leading the DMO team in developing automated surveillance programs and has uh, experienced over 12 years experience in both CBOT and CFTC. So Harry, we welcome your participation to give us a good overview. Oh, th thank you very much. Glad to be here. Um, following slides that I've prepared uh, present some electronic uh, trading statistics uh, in the United States. Uh, following that, I'd like to br very briefly discuss uh, some stop logic functionalities. Um, very quickly or very, very sh briefly, I should say, the first slide uh, is titled U.S. Futures and Options Trading. Uh, the data source for this is uh, CME, CBOT, NYMEX, and ICE futures volume data, uh, which together represented 99% of total U.S. volume in 2010. Uh, the y-axis shows uh, this volume in millions of contracts, and as you can see, uh, the total U.S. futures and options volume uh, was over 3 billion contracts in 2010. 83% of that volume was attributed to electronic trading. Uh, the graph also shows that pit volume, the blue bars, uh, has been uh, between about 500 million to a billion contracts since 1998, uh, and PID volume has been decreasing since 2006. Uh, the next slide <coughs> is um, electronic trading percentages for designated contract markets. Uh, the CME, CBOT, and NYMEX uh, are grouped uh, in the CME group totals. Uh, this uh, slide shows that seven exchanges have 100% uh, electronic trading volume. Uh, these exchanges do not currently have physical space dedicated to trading pits. Um, there are four major exchange groups that still have trading pits, and at those exchanges, uh, electronic trading uh, represented from 82 to 87 percent of total volume. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, just briefly touch on uh, the topic of uh, stop-loss cascading and uh, show some stop-logic numbers from the CME for 2010. Uh, DMO, uh, the, the Division of Market Oversight, uh, is in the process of reviewing the different methodologies uh, of stop logic cascading mitigation. Now, that's a lot of words all put together, but uh, uh, cascading mitigation functionality uh, is in place at the exchange level, so it's not really pre-trade. It's, it's at the exchange level. That I'm not aware of any uh, trading firms that have this in place, um, but that's, the, that's really the place for it to be because the exchange has the full volume, the uh, full vision of all the markets. Uh, CME, uh, NICE, LIFE, New York Stock Exchange, LIFE, and ICE have slightly different forms of stop logic cascading uh, mitigation functionality. Why the exact mechanics uh, of each of these programs is different across the exchanges, they do share some basic similarities such as price bands, limits, and reasonability ranges. In short, they are very similar, uh, yet they are very different. Uh, I will defer uh, specific questions about stop logic. Um, uh, to the exchanges, I understand uh, Dean, Dean Payton is here, and I'm glad to see him because uh, Dean provided me with some of the information regarding the CME stop logic functionality. Um, the, uh, the point I guess I'm trying to make is that, the, that it's, these functionalities are at the exchange level, that they're different, and, they all, um, and that we're looking into the kind of the market impact that these different functionalities have, if any, uh, or if there's a, a place for us to either normalize or not. Uh, but we're just, like I said, in the process of evaluating these options. Uh, they all effectively serve uh, to safeguard the market uh, from cascading, and we definitely saw this on May 6th. Uh, the, the numbers on the, the chart, as you can see, uh, in the energy complex at uh, CME, there was 22 stop logic events uh, in 2010. In uh, the agricultural space, there was 25. Metals had six. Equities, eight. Uh, the FX market had 14, and interest rates had two. Cascading stop loss orders are triggered if the market moves up or down to the level uh, pre-selected by the trader entering the stop orders. Uh, generally, the rules provide that when the market moves up or down to the trader's pre-selected stop level for such an order, the order becomes a limit order with a specified price limit, uh, or I should say limit price. These orders are then executable only to a price within the range of reasonability permitted by the system instead of becoming a market order. Uh, the CME uses a methodology called Globex Stop Logic a functionality, which pauses trading. Uh, this is called uh, the Stop Logic Reserve Period. This occurs when the trading engine recognizes that it has a series of resting stop orders uh, that would lead to a cascade. Uh, trading is halted for five seconds if it occurs between 9.30 a.m. and 4.15 p.m. in the E-mini uh, S&P, for example, and for 10 seconds during the balance of trading. During the reserve period, Globex accepts 
uh, market and limit orders that are priced within the reasonability range and will then execute the orders after the five second pause. The system will pause for another five second reserve period if the market and limit orders are uh, if the market and limit orders submitted during the previous pause are outside of the reasonability range. This would then cause the market to gap open after the two five-second reserve periods. On May 6, 2010, this functionality was only triggered for one five-second reserve period. Now, uh, the next exchange that uh, we looked at, uh, ICE Futures, uh, they call their program Cascading Stop Mitigation, uh, very similar, uh, and it applies to, quote, system-based uh, ice managed orders. It does not apply to stop orders which uh, rest in front of ISV or DAI systems which are not within the control of the ice trading platform. Uh, this functiona functionality is currently in place for the US DX and Russell index markets uh, but not for the softs markets. Um, and uh, they're, that's basically the two programs that we've looked at so far. Uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange has one, but uh, we haven't uh, dug in, into that one very much. Um, but that's really all I have. Uh, that, that the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, this is at the exchange level. It's not at, at uh, the clearing firm or the trading firm. Um, and we're looking at, in DMO, um, some of the consistency that, that uh, this uh, provides to the market um, and whether or not um, these programs should involve stopping the market or just pausing it uh, to let other market orders in. Um, and um, that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gorham? Yeah, I, I don't know if this, uh, Harold, if this is for you or for Dean Payton, but when, when you look at these numbers up, up there, you see quite a bit of difference. Is the, is the driver there essentially liquidity? The greater the liquidity that exists in the market, the less frequently this has to be triggered? Uh, I'll, I'll that defer to Dean. To Dean. Uh, Dr. Gorham, I, I think that's largely correct, and it also has to do with the parameters of the, the stop logic functionality. But if you look in our most liquid products, say the E-mini product, uh, the stop logic event that we had on May 6 was actually the only situation uh, during 2010 where that stop logic was implemented, and that was similarly true in 2009 uh, as well. So uh, when when you have you know, contracts that, uh, you know, are potentially more deferred uh, contracts that have more liquidity gaps. Uh, that's really what the stop logic functionality is there for. It's, it's really to, to mitigate those transitory liquidity gaps, allow uh, other market participants to come in and replenish that liquidity. So if you look at the statistics that, that Harry's put up there, I mean, arguably those are 77 instances where potentially disruptive uh, trading activity was mitigated by having this this control at the exchange level. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to comment that I, I think this is one of the, this is really a great innovation. And I don't know if people remember this, but back 2003, 2004, we used to get what we then called liquidity vacuums, and in, in the E mini S and P, and in the similar uh, thing at the board uh, contract at the board of trade. And you would have these situations oftentimes right before a three-day holiday, a three-day weekend, um, in which there, was ju there just weren't many traders there. And, and you would get in these electronic markets, you'd get the same kind of thing we had in the flash crash. And th this is a great example of, you know, of the exchanges themselves coming in, in both cases, coming in and, and creating a functionality that, that essentially kind of erased that for quite a while. I, I think that's... I think that's correct. In May 6, it was very helpful. I mean, it was, it, as it turned out, it was the absolute bottom of the E-mini. Um, one question, the Joint Advisory Committee, the other advisory committee, the CFTC, SEC one, raised is whether there are some circumstances where the stop-loss functionality, as, as it worked, um, you know, if it were to be triggered a second time or something, whether there is need for a longer than five second gap or something. And so I was just curious whether you have a point of view, whether your subcommittee looked at that or you know, uh, as the other committee raised it. Uh, I don't have a point of view on that, but I, there are many smarter people on my subcommittee than me. So 
I don't know if anybody does. Chair, Chairman Gensler, I, I, I think in terms of the, the manner in which the, the stop logic works, uh, first of all, we do have situations where the stop logic isn't five seconds. It can be calibrated at 10 seconds. We have some that go out to 20 seconds. So there is a calibration period that you can. That's by, is that, that's by product, right? Yes, that's yeah. by product. And then additionally, when a stop logic event occurs, if that liquidity doesn't come in, uh, the way the stop logic functionality uh, works in that situation is we would actually expand the, the price range and the time frame, and that would actually go through 12 iterations, right, of allowing, you know, extending the pause to allow liquidity to come in at different price levels. So I think that the, the Joint Advisory Committee and their dialogue around that, that functionality really didn't appreciate the full scope of what its capabilities are. Dean just are. said they've already taken care of it, but my question is, is you know, given that the advisory committee raised this uh, maybe maybe other times, maybe not today, it'd be good to know if you had a point of view. They were concerned with the potential cascading of stop-loss functionalities. I think Dean's saying you've taken that in consideration, and you may have. I'm just saying that the committee did give us something on that, so it'd be helpful if you all had any view on it. Uh, we have included in your packets and uh, the the May 6 report from the Joint Committee. I think it's in the back there, so you might take a look at that and reflect. Chuck, do you have a observation on ICE uh, stop logic, similar stop logic tools? Yeah, I was I, I would say we're still um, evolving that. We we just added uh, exchange traded stop limits probably about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago to the platform. I mean, prior to that. And I think probably still a majority of the stops we get today are actually triggered on a front end ISV. And so what we see is a market order. So we have market order protection limits that that uh, make sure that market order doesn't go through a price band. Um, the uh, stop logic that we have that uh, Harold uh, alluded to earlier and, and turned on in some of our markets, I mean, with, a, with an exchange traded stop, there's essentially only a few things that you can do when you have a cascade. You can implement some kind of pause or, or trading floor or ceiling, depending on the direction of the move, which is probably where we're going to evolve to. Uh, you can cancel any unfilled order, uh, which is what our current logic does. Some people like that. Some people hate it. Uh, or you can reprice the uh, triggered stop at the at the floor, which, uh, you know, a lot of people view that as, as the worst option because you may end up, if, if it is a if it is a momentary move or a spike and it's going to reverse quickly, uh, you're likely going to get executed at the worst fill of the day. So um, none of those are panaceas. And, and as Dean described a minute ago, I think that the logic can get very complicated quickly, almost more complicated than the original problem. I think we're also looking at the stop, uh, continuing to evolve our, our stop uh, logic functionality with just a broader uh, velocity-oriented uh, speed bump, whatever you want to call it, where uh, for any of the markets where we can deploy, if it goes down X percent or X number of ticks in Y amount of time, then again, don't stop trading, uh, but set a temporary price floor, or price ceiling, depending on the direction of the move, so that the same general idea though, you're trying to, you're trying to, uh, if there is anything erroneous going on, give the market time to put more logical prices back in, hopefully bounce off that floor. Uh, if it's, you know, if it's a move driven by market events, then eventually you're going to remove the floor and, you know, the market's going to continue trading in the same direction. Thank you. Any other questions for Harry or panelists? <clears throat> All right. Well, let's, um, Dr. Gorham, if you'll present your, your report. Thank you, Harry. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Michael Gorm is, is the head of our subcommittee, which we uh, uh, created in, in uh, at Thanksgiving uh, in order to begin to address uh, these pre-trade functionalities and associated with direct market access. Many of our rulemakings are considering what options we have uh, in implementing these pre-trade controls as we develop new rules for designated contract market and CEFs. We asked Dr. Uh, Gorm to kind of uh, reflect on the proposals in the industry today and uh, any other observations he might add and has put together this uh, the, the report we have before us which are in your binders and he will present that he is uh, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology um, served for more than three decades as a research economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco 
and served as a Vice President of Product Development, Commodity Marketing, Education, International Marketing, spanning 18 years at CME. He's also academic and research experience at ITT, IIT Center for Law and Financial Markets and has been the editor of the Journal of Global Financial Markets and also served as the first director of the, director, uh, of the Division of Market Oversight for the CFTC. So we appreciate his uh, experience and uh, is really the best candidate to uh, conduct this uh, subcommittee review and we look forward to his presentation. Thank you. Um, that, that actually makes me about 112 years old. I was counting up those numbers. But <laughs> Um, um, so the, the, the first thing I want to say is that um, uh, this committee, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing this presentation, but the committee really put this report together. So this is the intellectual product of, of these guys. And in fact, um, one of the points that we make out, that we, that we make in the, pres the, um, in the paper is that there's really three tiers in the electronic trading world. There is the trading firm. There is the clearing firm, and there is the exchange. And um, Commissioner O'Malley actually did a great job, I think, putting this, this uh, subcommittee together um, because you've got all three. You've got, in fact, you've really got the, ex the exchanges are really the most important in this uh, sphere, and you've got the two major exchanges in the U.S. on the committee, and that's, that's really good. Um, and Brian, Brian Durkin can't be here today, but uh, Dean Payton will be here to, to talk about uh, anything that, that might be relevant there. Um, you've got Gary DeWall in the, in the, the person of the, um, uh, the clearing firm, and you've got um, Chuck Whitman, uh, who's one of the premier trading firms in, um, uh, in Chicago. And I just found out a, a few minutes before we started today that um, Richard Gorlick actually had put together a set of uh, proposals, I think even three years before the uh, FIA came out with their initial ones. So um, there's a lot of other uh, very thoughtful um, consideration in the room that I think we'll be able to tap into. So what, I, what I'll do is just walk you quickly through the present, the, um, what the paper says, and um, uh, and then I hope that my committee members will be able to respond to all the questions and even add things if, if there aren't questions. So the, in terms of focus, first of all, we, we focused really on direct market access. So the idea here is that we are recommending pre-trade measures that would preserve market integrity in the case of direct market access. Um, I just want to put this one thought in your head before we proceed. I mean, it's like... Being at the CFTC is sort of like being a New York cop to some extent. I mean, what you see is are all the problems that you've got to solve and all the stuff that you have to fix, and you do. I mean, you, that, that's why you guys are all here. Um, but I just want to remind you and all of us here at the table that there's a lot of wonderful things that has come out of electronic trading. Many of us in this room have seen trading evolve all the way through. There is much greater transparency, there's much lower cost, there's greater liquidity, there's much broader participation in the markets than ever before, and, um, uh, and there's much, ac much, much faster access to these markets. So one of the things that we were trying to do in the, the, the things that we came up with is not to mess those things up, not to, to preserve those. Um, so the principles that were guiding us as we made our choices were, first of all, to preserve, I mean, this is an incredibly dynamic industry. And I think, you know, you can just jump back two years, two years before that, and you probably wouldn't have imagined seeing all the things that you've seen um, that, have, that have come out. So, uh, so we, we don't want to, we want to keep that dynamism. Um, one of the things that may be a little controversial here is this concept of bringing all hands on deck. In other words, we talked about all three tiers in the industry, and what we're doing is we are actually putting this responsibility in the laps of all three of those tiers. Um, some have argued, which is, which is partially correct, that the exchanges are key. They're the most important. Um, there, there are fewer exchanges. They are the ones that ensure that everybody has to, everybody who comes to the exchange would have to, um, to, to do what was required once you got to the matching engine. 
And so that's really the most important. But we've actually, and this may seem redundant, but we put obligations on the trading firms and on the clearing firms as well. And you'll see why in just a second. The, um, did I, sorry, the, uh, the third thing here is just to, is to make sure that we recognize each of these tiers has incentives. The trading firms obviously are trying to be faster than all the other trading firms and do whatever they can to minimize latency. And that's where direct market access came from, is the fact that, that you can save a certain number of milliseconds from doing that. The brokers obviously want to have that business. It's, this is a significant amount of business, an increasingly significant amount of business. Putting the burden on the brokers, as was done with the SEC, is something that, putting it solely on the brokers, is something that really doesn't make sense. Um, but, the bro but, the, but the clearing firms have to basically be involved. And the exchanges, the exchanges obviously are competing with one another, and so they have their own incentives in terms of minimizing latency for that purpose. But certainly anybody coming into a single exchange um, would basically have to abide by anything, any standards that the exchange set. Um, there's a fairness issue. There's actually two fairness issues. Um, the first one relates to what I just said, which is we don't want to have a situation where um, there's any kind of a race to the bottom where a clearing firm that acts less or a trading firm that acts less responsibly is put at some kind of an advantage. So the, the standards that we put in try to do that. Um, the other part of the fairness issue is to make sure that the, the new swaps execution facilities are treated the same as the designated contract markets. And of course, any foreign board of trade that's, for, that's relevant in the US market um, should really have the same obligations. Um, finally, in terms of these guiding principles, there's this issue of coordinating with the SEC. Um, there was, you, you have a, a joint commission on that. Um, but the idea here is that those firms that are both FCMs and broker-dealers would certainly benefit from having um, similarity across the two uh, w regulatory worlds. Okay, so we put we we looked at the other reports, not just the FIA reports, but certainly the April and November FIA reports. And some of you in this room have worked on, have been have participated in that. And what we've attempted to do is to distill from those reports the things that we felt were really essential to get done. And one of the issues I think that can be discussed is, did we leave anything out or does this do an adequate job of doing that? So in terms of, I'll just quickly go through the three, um, the three levels. So starting with the trading firms, um, the, 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 the trading firms uh, must establish pre-trade quantity, pre quantity limits uh, per, for each order. Um, in fact, these first two things, the quantity limits and the price collars, are basically restrictions that the firms would put on themselves that would even prevent the order from leaving the firm and going to the exchange. Um, the pre-trade uh, price collars, obviously, are meant to prevent orders from being submitted that have prices that are far off the current market. The next two things, the execution throttles and the message throttles, are basically cases where you would stop shipping um, trades if, in fact, too many executions or too many messages were resulting from these algorithms. And the, there would have to be human intervention before that could start up again. Um, finally, every trading firm would have to have uh, a kill button in order to basically stop uh, all orders that had been, basically to stop orders from being executed that had been already sent and to stop any further orders from going in. And this would be kind of a, a hopefully something that would almost never happen, but it would be a fail-safe um, backup. Moving to the clearing firms. So the major job of the clearing firms is to ensure that their client trading firms behave. Um, so the, the idea would be that they would have to ensure that the trading firms do establish the functionalities that we just listed, that they would utilize these functionalities for all trading done by the trading firm, that the parameters in these, that is to say the, 
um, the price uh, limits, the quantity limits would have to be parameters that had been agreed to by the clearing firm and that they, the clearing firm would obtain written certification um, of all of those uh, things that I just mentioned as well as written certification from um, the, uh, the independent software vendor if in fact the trading firm's trading was done from the ISV server as opposed to the trading firm server itself. Um, the clearing firm would have to have access to the trading firm's kill button. Finally, the exchange. So in terms of the, as I said before, the exchange is really the key anchor in controlling risk. Um, so what it would, whatever it would set up, it would have to requ require that all firms use these controls. It, the firms wouldn't have a choice to use or not. They would all, all have to do that. So we would have the, the exchanges would have pre-trade quantity limits on individual orders. Um, they would have intraday position limits that would be um, set by the clearing firms. Um, they would have pre-trade price collars that we spoke of before and also have message throttles. Um, the, in addition to that, the, um, the, the exchanges would allow clearing and trading firms to set automatic cancellation of orders if there was a case where the trading firm was disconnected from the exchange um, and would also allow the trading firms and clearing firms to view um, both working and filled orders and to cancel working orders if necessary. Um, the final thing uh, for the exchange is to ensure that they have clear air trade policies. Um, and I should say that the exchanges have a lot of these things that we're talking about here already, but have clear tr air trade policies that favored trade price adjustment as, uh, as opposed to bu simply busting trades. Um, the idea here is that if all three of these tiers uh, work together on this problem, um, we think this would go a long way to prevent any sort of errant algorithm sneaking in and taking the system down. Um, so I, I, maybe I would first ask if any of my fellow committee members want to add anything to what I've just said. Uh, a couple of points. I thought Mike did a good job summarizing our report. Um, I think th three additional points. One, um, all of the uh, things that we were suggesting the exchanges should do, I think uh, we feel strongly should apply to swaps execution facilities equally as well, particularly any that are going to offer direct market access. Um, second point, I think we tried to keep in mind, I don't know that we explicitly said it in the report, but we tried to keep in mind the original request of the commission, and that is to give some guidance on how prescriptive can you be or not be and potential rulemaking uh, to uh, require these three different tiers to do these things. So I think you'll see in the report that we had general agreement on, um, on the bulleted items uh, I think as uh, on the exchange there, you see the pre-trade quantity limits, intraday position limits, pre-trade price collars and meshes throttles and so forth, that I think we feel that's the level of prescription that maybe the commission should target, not specify how message throttles should be done, leave that up to the exchanges to, uh, to innovate there, to come up with policies that fit individual markets, depending on how liquid they are, how widely traded they are, what time of day they trade, those type of things. Uh, but at least to give you some specificity that you could put into some rulemaking. Uh, and I think the third point in response to, I believe, uh, uh, Commissioner Chilton raised, raised it in his remarks of um, who's going, you know, putting, a, a, I guess, closer ties between the HFT traders and, uh, and someone else in terms of uh, a second set of eyes looking at what they're doing, not that um, the, the commission or, or the exchange, for that matter, could go in and sit on in their on their side of the uh, of the table and, and know what's going on with their algorithm. But I think uh, both Brian and I f both felt from the exchange side we already have fairly rigorous uh, conformance tests uh, that the uh, direct market access traders have to go through. Uh, it's largely technology te 
technology oriented, uh, just making sure that um, you know they, the orders that they're sending us and that we're receiving are indeed the ones they intended to send, and that they are interpreting the, our market data feeds in the proper way and so forth. But I think uh, we can add um, some additional checks there. Uh, they would largely be documentation provided by the HFTs and, and representations by the HFTs because. Most of the tests you'll notice are negative tests. You know, uh, don't send us something. Don't send us too many messages. So there's really no way for us on an exchange side to, you know, uh, the, to, to see a sign of whether that happened or not. So I think, but it's a natural extension of, of our relationships with, with these high frequency traders to, to bolt on uh, some additional verification of the conformance process that they indeed, and they're signing that they indeed have incorporated these uh, uh, this functionality, pre trade functionality. Gary? Thank you. And I, I, I agree. I think our, our, our chairman of our subcommittee did an excellent job in, in summarizing uh, where we came out. I, I would say that when I read the, um, the SEC CFTC Advisory Committee on Emerging Regulatory Issues and their special report, what did strike me was the fact that the discussion only related to the exchanges. Uh, and the brokers. I, I was surprised at, 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 at other than trying to induce liquidity through maybe some kind of uh, congestion pricing, uh, there really wasn't a lot of discussion about the trading firms ex themselves except to the bemoan the fact that market makers were sort of disappearing and, and high frequency traders were somehow there. And, and I do think that when we look at this issue, um, you've got to consider the responsibility of all players. I think that's what the FIA uh, best practices study did uh, last year. And I think it's something important to consider. The other thing that I, I was struck is, is, is when I was asked personally, well, you know, what kind of regulatory proposals do you think we need to, to do something and make things better? I was also a little surprised by that because as a, as a clearing firm, I sort of thought I had responsibilities already uh, in, in this area. I, I thought I had responsibilities to have prudent risk management uh, practices, and I thought I had duty of supervision. Uh, over my account, so I was actually wondering whether I, I now was g being given a buy somehow, uh, and, I, and, and I actually had just been more conservative all these years uh, than I should have been. Just, just no. <laughs> Rats, I thought I'd try. <laughs> no hall pass for you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think there's an element of practicality here that, that we've got to look at. I know Nick Garrow, I don't want to keep him, he's my colleague from London, and, it's, and he's going to speak in a few minutes about some of the logistical issues and some of the practical issues that, that we've had trying to implement uh, solutions, uh, and it's late there, so I'm going to definitely shut up quickly. Uh, but, you know, this all begins as a matter of practicality. One thing that, that strikes me again is that, yes, I mean, trading firms are, are, are customers, and to the extent that trading firms uh, do stupid things like sometimes they do now and they, they commit market offenses and um, I mean, the CFTCs never lacked authority to go after people who, 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 who do, uh, uh, you know, commit manipulation or, 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 or commit other types of market offenses under 4C. Um, and so as a result, um, because, trading practice, uh, because trading firms have an interest in not violating the rules as they exist, and they also have an interest in their own financial uh, solvency, um, the responsible ones act responsibly, and they do a lot of the stuff that we're already talking about they should do. From the brokerage firm, you know, and this is where, where, where you know, I, I've always been a little confused, um, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll speak a, a, a little story because I think it's, it's useful. I mean, we have an obligation right off the bat. Uh, you know, we don't have, as in the securities industry, the, the technical know-your-customer type of obligations and suitability, uh, although, you know, we obviously have them in the AML area. Um, but obviously, we select our customers, and we, we also cons are concerned about our capital and our, and our preservation, and we want to do business with customers who, who aren't going to put us out of business ourselves. And so there's a certain amount of due diligence that we want to conduct right off the beginning, uh, and that's important. And it's important that we, we select customers, uh, particularly in the high-frequency area, who we think are, are responsible. And, and, and when the, the trading firms themselves came out uh, uh, again last year, with some recommendations that they themselves should be held to, uh, we said that's good because that's the kind of stuff we can now hold them to in our due diligence uh, uh, process. But there's another, you know, real practical issue. And when, when this whole debate sort of rose up last year, um, and we, we changed uh, CEOs in our organization globally, he asked a very good question. He said, how much do these firms actually make for us? He says, because you've got to look at a reward risk 
uh, analysis. So not only is there a suitability assessment in the first place, but since you are taking the risk that one of these firms could, you know, do something wrong, blow up, whatever, uh, you better make sure you're making a fair amount of money so that, uh, you know, they the right ratio uh, of, of, of return risk. So I think that at the beginning, brokers not only have an initial obligation to assess their clients, make sure that they're doing um, the right things, that they're re reputable people. And in the high-frequency world, again, we now have these new, new standards to test. But ongoing, to, to keep on making sure that they're abiding by the rules they agree to, uh, and probably, even though it's not a regulatory issue, uh, making sure they make, they make money. Um, then, obviously, we think that it's very, very important that, the, that, that there be risk filters at not just the exchange level, because I think um, um, uh, as Charles said, I think that would, that would prejudice the exchange. Any regulated type market, whether it's the regulated exchanges or the ATSs in the securities world, whether it's the CEFs or the DCMs in, in, in our world, if you're putting out a public exchange and you're allowing people to come in in a direct access way, then there should be some kind of filters there. We believe they should be at the exchange level, and I think even our clients believe they should be at the exchange levels, because if not, you have a situation like you have now under the securities world, where you are going to have a race to minimum compliance to whatever the rules are going to be at the broker level. Because at the end of the day, we're all competing with each other. The trading firms are all competing with each other. Uh, and, 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 the, and the name of the game, as we discussed early on, is low latency. Uh, and, 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 and we want to have a high bar, not a low bar. Okay, and, 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 the, and the markets themselves are best able because they know what the parameters of their markets are. They know liquidity issues. They know that there might be a difference between how you should allow access to agricultural markets versus uh, equities markets versus fixed income markets. They know and have a better feel uh, of, of what kind of risk control should be there, uh, and they can make the bar equal for all entrants. So we think that's very, very important. Uh, 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 not just in the, in the futures markets where, where traditionally it's been easier uh, to have controls at that level, but in all markets, securities as well as, as futures. And going forward, uh, when, the, when, when, the, um, uh, when the when the SES are out there also. And then finally, again, from the broker perspective, I mean, one of the issues, and I know uh, it's a debate that goes on, is what kind of electronic pre-filtering should occur? Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, it's not in our interest as a broker to allow our clients to do dumb things. Um, but, you know, technologically, it's not as easy as it seems to be to prevent dumb things. Um, one of the great struggles we've had as an organization globally, uh, and not so much in the United States, but certainly outside the United States, is even getting timely feeds after the fact of exchange data that we can run through our computers to do analytics that we want to do um, uh, to make sure our, our, our clients are behaving. The problem with running those analytics in advance of trading and, and actually acting on it is that on behalf of our clients, we may not be seeing the entire trade. We may be only seeing a part of a trade. And for us to stop a trade because we think something in a nanosecond may be wrong could be devastating to that client because it's actually part of another trade that we're not seeing and we could be wrong. And, and the liability issues would be just dramatic on us um, a, after the fact. It's just, at least under the current uh, legal framework, not something that we hope we have to get into uh, because it's a mess. But post-trade, absolutely. We should be given, as a brokerage company, data as quickly as possible in as uniform a, a layout as possible. And, 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 and you know, it, again, because we're responsible, we want to do analytics on our clients as, as quickly as possible. So again, to, re, to, to just um, you know, re, re, reinforce what's been saying, it's a shared process. Um, you know, people who are responsible in this business are already acting practically. As the technology gets better, we can even uh, act better. Um, and, and as far as I was aware, um, I've already got this kind of obligation. Um, so you know, whether it needs to be a little tweaking here or there, you know, I, I'll let others decide other than me. But to me, the obligation to be responsible is already out there. Brenda? Yeah, I'd just like to um, thank the subcommittee for the balanced view across the trade uh, process of risk management responsibilities. Um, I think it's important. But I have a question of the subcommittee, and that is um, your thoughts about the role of the regulator. You know, after the rulemaking occurs, um, what type of governance process, perhaps, or post-execution 
penalties? You know, what, what did you discuss as the ongoing role of a regulator? Um, I'll, I'll start. We really didn't get into the area of penalties at all. Um, and uh, depending upon the funding of the, of the commission, it's going to be difficult to, to say, you know, what actually could be done from the point of view of enforcement. I mean, we were, we were kind of coming from an ideal world, but yeah, you're raising a great question. And I, let me punt it to anybody else on the committee that's got some thoughts on this. Well, as, as I just said a few seconds ago, I mean, I've always lived under an I've always lived under the assumption that I have a duty, an obligation to supervise my accounts, my my, my personnel, um, and having just been fined by the commission a couple of weeks ago from my firm, uh, I, I know it's serious. Um, and you know, if you if you if you don't act responsibly, you're probably going to get penalized. Um, you know, I, I think there's a debate that goes on forever. In fact, I was having this debate with a, a foreign regulator last night. I remember 15 years ago uh, when the London regulators went to principles-based regulator and everybody said, oh, that's going to be a great scenario because it's going to be broad principles and strict enforcement. Uh, and, and the industry wanted that. That was about three years when there was a lot of enforcement action. Of course, the industry said, no, no, we don't want such broad principles. We want things that are much more narrow so we have a, uh, a, 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 a careful uh, uh, mapped to know what we're going to do. So I know there's always tension, but you know it, it seems to me again that um, the reality of life is whether I want it or it, it or, or 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 I don't want it. Um, if I act irresponsibly and if, if if there is going to be a problem out there, um, you know market participants are going to get dinged. That's just the way it works uh, in, in a regulated environment. Um, uh, obviously, the regulators need the tools to be able to monitor markets. I mean, I'm very sympathetic when I when I when I hear the 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 the, the pleas of the of the commissioners for funding. Um, you know, I know what it costs my organization. Again, you know, Nick Garrell will speak in a few seconds. I know what it costs my organization just for the bit you know the bit of the trades that that we look at. Um, I, I just have to assume it's multiples of that for what the commission is looking at, um, and, and and they desperately need the technology. Uh, and they desperately need the cooperation of the exchanges, probably not just in the in the United States, because through the memorandums of understandings, just like we need to understand that the client is placing his trade on the CME versus trades against the Hong Kong exchange uh, and, 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 and the TIFEX, um, uh, the regulators, the CFTC needs that too to truly understand what's going on out there. So the, the technology demands are tremendous. So uh, I, I think they have an obligation to, or responsibility to do the, the proper kind of surveillance, understand the full scope of what's going on. Uh, and they need to work closely with their international um, uh, co colleagues. And then as far as industry participants, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably going out on a limb here, and I'm sure I'm going to get yelled at by all my uh, colleagues at my uh, competitors. But you know, the, the name of the game is if you, if you, if you, you act irresponsibly, you're going to get dinged. If I can kind of drill down on Brenda's, uh, what Brenda has started here, it is, as I look at this, and, and it appears, Michael, that, that your the subcommittee is really basing it upon the FIA's uh, uh, PTG white paper, and that's what everybody has come together on a consensus of that that's where we are, and I, I'm wondering where that is vis-a-vis -vis the regulations that we're currently working on. Uh, the second thing uh, that uh, strikes me because you're, you're asking both the exchanges and the clearing firms to, to uh, supervise the trading firms and you're saying that they should take reasonable measures and I, I kind of like to know what does reasonable measures mean because that's something that we're wrestling with right now. Uh, and, and then this, uh, Gary, if I, I understand your answer, was that you think the regulator comes in at the end when someone uh, steps over the boundary uh, and, and slaps their hands or uh, gives them a, a, a fine. And, and, and this is when I made my opening statement about people thinking that we're putting the fox in the hen house, we're asking the industry to do this overall regulation and we don't have a role until the end of the day when we see that something has happened. And is there a role for the regulator before we get to that point? Chuck, I think, started to say something 
do, can you weave that in? Well, I mean, I sorry, this here. Chuck Whitman, well. I think there's a couple of points that are, are worth noting on this. Uh, I thought, Gary, you explained the role of the clearing firm very well. And I think one of the things that's important is for us as a trading firm, um, there, there's a series of things that, as Gary talked about, if you look in the prop trading community, you look in the principal trading community, most of us trade our own money. And as such, it's our own capital that's at risk on a day in and day out basis. We don't have clients, we don't have customers. And a big thing for us is reward to risk. We wanna make sure that tomorrow we can come back and trade. And I can tell you my own experience, we've had strategies that we've gone through and looked at that we made choices at the expense of latency to make the, the, the strategy more safe and stable. And there's things that we, one thing I wanted to clarify uh, that, that Michael talked about is we, we control, all, um, we control the pre-trade quantity limits and the pre-trade price collars, but we also, we also control the message throttles. And the message throttles are a key component that we use in, in managing orders going in and out the door. Quantity limits keep orders that are too big from going out. Price collars keep mispriced orders from going out. And throttles keep too many orders from going out. Um, one thing that I think we all have learned is that you do everything you can to minimize, uh, uh, to, to eliminate errors. You know, we have a code base that's several million lines of code for our, our company. And when you have several million lines of code, no matter how hard you try, you, you're going to have some errors. So then what do you do to minimize the impact of errors? And so you do everything you can to eliminate them. And then if you do have them, how do you minimize them? These are things that we put in place to be able to minimize the, or the impact of an error. Uh, in addition, one of the things that I will back up that Gary said is anytime that we have a clearing, anytime that we, uh, in all of our clearing relationships, both when we came in from an introductory standpoint and then in an ongoing standpoint, we basically are going through a thorough interview. And they come through and there's a lot of things they want to see. Do you have a quality assurance department? Uh, are you stress testing your, your releases? Are you stress testing your software? What is your oversight policies? Um, these sort of things that, that we are being um, held accountable for to be able to have the relationship in the first place. One of the things that we did last year is we actually started a risk working group within our firm that people from compliance, people from technology, engineers, they meet twice a month and they talk about what can we do to make the way that we trade in our firm more stable and more safe. And we actually have given uh, access to that to some of the clearing firms at various points in times. So they can come in and have even more comfort with how we do things. Um, one of the things I also want to add is that Michael alluded to this race to the bottom. I believe that standardization for firms like ours is actually a benefit to somebody like me because the standardization makes a level playing field and I don't have to worry about somebody else cutting a corner that then not only hurts the industry, but also potentially hurts us in one of our strategies. And so I, I want to make sure that I represent that from the firm side, that firms like ours actually spend a lot of money, put a lot of time in to make sure that we stay safe. It's our business that's at stake. Uh, the, next, the next thing is going to your question, uh, Commissioner, or your, your statement. Um, when, we put this, when we put this plan together, one of the things that we talked about as a committee was how could we put this together in a way that was enforceable, that could be looked after. And one of the things that we really believed is you needed to have multiple layers of redundancy at the firm level, at the clearing firm level, and at the exchange level. And from a regulator standpoint, the easiest places to, for the regulator to check in is at the exchange. The firm level, there's just so many firms and there's so many strategies. It's just very hard to get into the specifics of any one thing. But, uh, but if, you have, if you have principles and you have checklists of things that you have to have in place, like you have to have a quality assurance team and you have to stress test releases before you put releases out, things of that nature are things that, that are good for firms like ours and they're good for the industry. And I think as we put that together, that, that was why we kind of uh, put, the, put together the proposal the way that we did is we put it in a way that we thought was practical to be enforced. 
Yeah, I was just going to add, that, I mean, the, the nature of kind of the remit that the subcommittee had was, you know, what kind of technology can you and should you implement at these three levels to prevent bad things from happening? You know, in most of the world, you can only prevent so many things. Policing is typically an after-the-fact function. You know, the crime's already occurred. So this is really, this was an opportunity and a scoped uh, discussion based on the FIA report uh, to, to at those three tiers, what can we do to prevent excessive messaging or to prevent fat finger errors that, that result in error, error trades? So, um, you know, we're not we're not going to consider it an enforcement issue if someone sends us uh, an excessive amount of messaging that goes past our throttle. We're not going to accept it as an exchange. We're going to look at the firm that sent that to us. They may have a different parameter set than we we do. We didn't vouch for their parameter. Uh, it's it's up to them to set their parameter at a proper level. It's up to us to protect the exchange and the rest of the participants from excessive messaging. So the parameters may be different. We're going to we're probably going to have a discussion there, but we're not going to view that as a, as a type of uh, uh, issue that, that, that some enforcement action needs to take place. I think there are other things we do that are beyond the scope of the subcommittee, which was on the, on the pre trade area, but, but the exchanges certainly do. I'm sure the clearing firms do as well. Um, but from an exchange, we're the tend to be the enforcement entity, the SRO. Um, you know, we have things like uh, volume uh, messaging policies uh, to discourage excessive meshing. You know, do more than discourage it, actually fine them, uh, charge a fee on it. And I think just as a, uh, maybe as an interesting point, I, I would mention, uh, I would say over the last year, our exchanges, we've moved toward viewing those types of things as primary purpose protecting the exchange. In other words, the integrity of our markets, the capacity of our systems and so forth, toward more of a, uh, we may be, the point is we may have thresholds and, and, and penalties at levels that are far below a level that would cause us any problems, but based on the market in question and the type of messaging we're getting, is, are they bids and offers that are far away from the market and they tend to be noise? Um, are they resulting in very few fills? Um, to, you know, to, to look at it more as, as a structural issue for our participants uh, and, and, and not, you know, the term quote stuffing, which has been thrown about just essentially, which is a way of saying, you know, a lot of not productive messaging and orders that everyone has to consume or process to minimize and reduce that. So just a little change in focus there from internally looking at what we can handle versus what, you know, what's, re what's reasonable to expect uh, a typical customer to be able to handle. I have a, a couple of different questions, I think, um, with regard to the, the scope. And as I alluded to in my opening statement, you know, we've been discussing these issues for a number of years, and I think the discussion continually evolves. And I appreciate what you've given us here with the different levels in the supply chain having different um, um, best practices or guidance for, for every level along the way. But the the concern I think that we've always had is how consistent are these principles or guidance applied across the market? And do you have any sort of um, sense to tell us? I mean, I know the people around the table say, we do this. This the trading firms, clearing firms, exchanges, we do this. But is it b broadly consistent that everyone in the market has or abides by these principles? And I guess as a follow-up sort of to that, um, following on to Brenda's question, if the, the commission looks at this, then do we adopt these as hard and fast rules? That these are rules that every step along the supply chain has to abide by, and if everyone doesn't consistently apply them, then you know, you're, you're violating the act. Um, even though he's not on the committee, could I ask Rich Gorlick to respond to that? Because he said something directly along those lines earlier today. Thank you, Michael. Uh, a couple things on that. I think that, that there's probably a regulatory role for some broad level enforcement um, or some broad level rule setting about what types of checks uh, should be in place at the various levels. Um, that said, I would caution over having a very static, prescriptive list because I think that would both give us a false sense of security as markets change, as strategies change, and as best practices change. And it would also limit us um, in ways where we wouldn't necessarily be pushing towards the best risk management that we could possibly have. In that regard, I think that this uh, subcommittee report is very helpful. 
and very useful. I really feel that putting the responsibility at all three levels um, is particularly helpful. And as you point out, there's probably a fourth level, which is where the regulators should touch in with the process. And my guidance would be to have it at a broad level rather than at a you know highly detailed level. In that said, um, you know, going through this list, I came up with another list, which are additional checks that we think are helpful um, and that we do. And I wouldn't want to have anything that would discourage that type of continual evolution of thinking. Whenever we read about some kind of problem in the industry, some kind of uh, unexpected trading, we try and get together and do an in-house postmortem and say, hey, do we have checks that would have prevented us from doing that particular thing and to continually be learning from the process? So a couple of things that I would want to throw out to the group for discussion. Um, one thing that's not on the trading firm list here, for example, is position size limits. Um, they've got a trade by trade quantity limit, but not a limit on an overall position size. And I think we all intend to limit how big our positions are in different ways. And you can view that on a product by product basis. You can view that on a strategy by strategy or on a portfolio wide basis, taking into account both the capital um, at the firm and that's intended to be exposed as well as different risk metrics. I think it's important to be thinking about those. Rich, can I just ask you a question? There's an intraday um, limit on here. Is that different than the overall position? The intraday so, limit how? that you were looking at, that is at the exchange level. And what I'm urging is that those position limits, they may be intraday, they may be cross-day, depending on the strategy. Um, they should be considered not just at the exchange level, but at the clearing firm level and at the trading firm level. He's exactly right. And so, like, for example, in our firm, we're an options market making firm. So we, we have position limits, not in contract space, but in Vega space, gamma space, unit space, um, uh, calendar spread space, like in, and literally the system will shut down if somebody violates a, a, a position parameter that we have in place. They won't be able to trade anymore. And so that's an example of what Richard's talking about. It's it, so. You know, if, if if we might have a group and we might set, and it's tied to capital. So, like for example, a group may not be able to be long or short more than fifty thousand dollars of weighted Vega, which is a measurement of volatility. And if they get longer more than fifty thousand, they it, it, they can't trade anymore, and they get shut down. And we they, we have to turn it back on for them. So it comes to us. So that's an example of of what he's talking about. Exactly, and that's also a good example where you need to take into account not only pre-trade risk, but post-trade risk, because a lot of those uh, options, Greeks, evolve based on what's going on in the market rather than just what's going on. So you can't necessarily feel that if you prevent an order from going out at a particular time that you've solved that particular problem. Um, another limit that we measure for are loss limits. Again, on a strategy-by-strategy strategy basis or on a firm-wide basis, you know, a good sign that something's not going as intended is if you're losing more money than you would expect to have in a normal risk setting. Uh, that's an important limit that needs to be set at the trading firm level um, and possibly uh, at the clearing firm level, although as uh, Gary pointed out, it may be very difficult to do that at the exchange level because so many strategies are cross-market. Um, you know, we've seen different problems at various exchanges in multiple markets that we've solved for. One of them is a number of open orders problem. There was in a different market outside of the CFTC purview, there was a situation where someone sent uh, Mil a million orders at different levels in a price book. Um, we sat down and said, hey, do we have a, a check that would prevent us from doing that? We had checks that would prevent you know, other things that would be related to that, but not that specific thing. We built that into the system. Um, you know, I'm always cautious to brag about risk management. It's not something you want to do. We all make mistakes. It's all possible. So I want this to be sort of taken in the spirit of, you know, we need to continue to learn and need to continue to calibrate as we go forward. I've got a number of other things there. I don't want to take everyone's time with that today, uh, but a couple other things I think are worth considering um, as a responsibility of both the trading firm, the clearing firm, and the exchange are sort of the near-time post-trade risk management uh, that needs to be considered, particularly um, the ability to get efficient drop copies from exchanges and clearing firms to circulate those so that we can do a real-time or near-time reconciliation to make sure that our views of positions across exchanges across clearing firms and across trading firms are, uh, are accurate and consistent. And I think that's something that is evolving in the industry that we try and do wherever we're able to get the appropriate feeds from the exchanges and the clearing firms. But it is an important thing to keep in mind um, that you know, particular types of problems would not be caught merely pre-trade. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.
just on, on my first question, if, if you or if anybody around the table has a sense on how consistently these recommendations are being abided by. Commissioner yeah, Summers. Um, I, I, I think there's two things, and I'll, I'll answer your, your question more directly in a second. But I, I do think that it's important for, for this group, the Commission, and all of the industry to really recognize uh, the tremendous work that's been done. I don't think in our industry that it has been a race to the bottom. And notwithstanding the fact that we haven't had prescriptive regulations, all of these good things have, have developed over the last five or so years. And, you know, if you look at our industry, uh, May 6th, we didn't bust any trades, right? Uh, on the security side, there were more than 20,000 trades that were busted. Uh, we, you know, we did have pause logic in effect. We do have circuit breakers in effect. Uh, we have protection points. So there's, there's a lot of good things that have been developed, the things that Rich and Chuck talked about in terms of the, uh, the things that firms have put into place to protect uh, themselves and their clearing firms. Uh, those are all very good things that continue to evolve. People are interested in, you know, protecting against uh, problems in the marketplace. And as both Gary and Chuck said, you know, protecting their own capital, right, that's at risk. So I, I think it's important just first of all to, uh, you know, celebrate all the good things that have been done in the industry over the course of the last five years. Uh, and I think it's a testament to, to the fact that people are focused on these things. Uh, to, to your point, um, you know, I, I do think that broadly speaking, uh, virtually all the proprietary trading firms that are out there do employ uh, these types of uh, checks on their systems, some better than others. Uh, in most of the situations where we have seen things gone awry, it's not because they didn't have any checks in place, it's because certain of the checks that they had in place didn't work as well as they had anticipated they would under those particular market circumstances. So it is, it is a constant learning, uh, you know, issue. And uh, I do think that, you know, some of the things that uh, Commissioner Dunn, Commissioner Chilton talked about earlier in terms of doing more work up front, you know, to certify that there are processes and procedures and testing in place are all very constructive things to do. But in, in a world, you know, at, at our exchange where we're trading three billion contracts a year and you have, uh, you know, tens of thousands of market participants and all this technology coming together, there are going to be errors, there are going to be mistakes. And I think that what we try and do on an exchange level and what industry participants try to do is put in place uh, certain types of uh, checks, whether they're, you know, risk mitigation mitigation checks or volatility mitigation checks to, to really try and uh, keep those types of issues from occurring. I mean, just think of, you know, all the times at the exchange level, the fact that you have protection points in place prevents something bad from happening, you know, or all the, you know, the times that you have, you know, stop logic kicking in that presents something bad from happening. Um. We move to the chairman's questions now. If everybody can keep their questions or responses tight, um, it's going to be one of those meetings if we don't. Yeah, actually, I don't want more than one person to answer any one of my questions. Uh, and uh, I, I, um, I think this is an excellent report and very helpful. What I get confused about is uh, <clears throat> when people said, don't be prescriptive. It sort of reminded if you said, well, you think that everybody should have a speed limit, but each person on the highway can pick their own speed limit. I'm not sure that really is. So, so I'm going to just focus on the exchanges. Just a yes or no. <laughs> Should we as a regulator include in our rules something proscriptive with regard to uh, any one of these four things, pre-trade quantity limits? Um, I do recognize if we just say have pre-trade quantity limits that uh, the exchanges could compete and have a race to the bottom. So is it just yes or no? Should we be prescriptive or not? I'm not asking what the limit should be, but should anybody? I think the exchange is in a better position to determine okay, that's what those a no. parameters are. That's a no. That's from the exchanges. But Dr. Gorham, who, I mean, you helped write this report. 
you're not put the buttons not pushed it wouldn't matter <laughs> I'm, I mean uh, I, I don't have I I'm reluctant I've got a gut reaction that there should not be a prescriptive Right, limit. So I'm just saying my, I'm only one commissioner, but my reaction is it's like saying there should be speed limits, but don't set them. I, I don't, but I mean, just, so because there is competition between exchanges, and as Chuck points out, there'll be CEFs, and I don't know how many there'll be. So what if there's, you know, you know, what you might consider to be a less responsible platform than you all are? So that's a, just, um, you know, um, the second question I have, I, I know where you are, Dean. I know you don't. I know. I got it. Um, uh, I, my second question is, is then would the exchanges, even if we don't set them, would the exchanges have some something specific that all trading firms have to have these uh, policies and procedures that are in the first phase? Is that what the recommendation is? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. I'd well, is it your recommendation that the exchanges have policies and procedures where every one of the trading firms must have these? Um, you had five categories here, but that, that all trading firms have to have the five? The recommendation is that the, if you, if the, the last slide on exchange is that the exchange would have those things itself, the clearing firms would ensure that the trading firms had those okay, five. Okay, so I said, so the clearing firms would have to have a role to make sure that the trading firms have these five things. Correct. But again, they could be different quantity limits, different price qualers, different throttles, different kill buttons. Correct, and even could be different by trader and by firm, exactly, and by product. How do you avoid the race to the bottom, then? I'm going to let Chuck Whitman respond to Is that. Is that because you don't think you could avoid it? It's a it's it's a potential problem. Okay, I I've finished my questions on that. My only other question is is how many of the firms by show of hands spend less than thirty one million dollars a year on technology? The CFTC is the only one. We're not a firm. That's the challenge we have right now, a great challenge we have. None of the firms around the table spend less than $31 million. Your regulator that's to ensure the American public has a marketplace that's transparent, open, competitive, free of fraud manipulation, spends one year on technology less than any of the firms in the technology advisory committee. That's a challenge we have. So we can only write rules because <laughs> we really can't do much and rely on the exchanges, which I'm just worried there would be a race to the bottom, um, and rely on the clearing firms. We didn't get you off the hook. Let, let me be the devil's advocate to the chairman here, because I, I do see a role, and I, I'm, I'm really, frankly, I'm buoyed by the fact when I, when I hear uh, Chuck and Richard talking about every time something happens out there, the risk committees get together and they assess it and they say, well, it didn't happen to us, but could it happen to us? Um, but how widespread is that? And is it uniform throughout the industry? And the only way we're gonna be able to, to have that holistic look, Gary, that you're talking about uh, of who's on the other side of the trade or what else is in that trade is by having the technological capabilities to see that, but also then we're responsible or the SROs are responsible. We're going to go out and do a regulatory review to see how well you are complying with whatever we come up with, which is getting out of that prescriptive mode uh, that we've got and into what we've had in the past is uh, principle-based regulatory regime here, uh, but I don't think we even have the resources to be able to do that. I'm agreeing with you, Commissioner Dunn, that we don't have the resources. I just think that that the trading firms will go, not the trading firms, the exchanges might go from two to many as this swap execution facilities. And so I think it would be very helpful to know, maybe not today, well, not this slide, but the earlier slide that had the four or five things that we might have for trading firms. 
uh, uh, you almost had it. Um, and I'm sorry, the exchanges. On the exchanges, pre-trade quantity limits, how do we ensure that there's some consistency, to use Commissioner Summer's point, that the exchanges aren't competing with each other? Even if we rely on the exchanges, maybe in collaboration to set a number, that there's not some competition uh, on the four very thoughtful points that the exchanges. That, that's where I'm concerned about, that there could be uh, not, the competition is good, but not necessarily in all places. Like, you wouldn't want one exchange to have uh, lower risk and one exchange to have higher risk because of these four points. I, I think, you know, like uh, the trading firms and the clearing firms have their money at risk, the exchanges do as well. And I mean, even though there's intense competition going on, all of these things have continued to, there hasn't been a race to the bottom, there's been a multiplication of additional checks and uh, uh, more pre-trade functionality. So um, I think, you know, it's in our business best interest to have people not have a bad experience, uh, regulators not see bad experience uh, for things going on in our exchange. I, I would give a counter view, uh, I think, on your question earlier. I think from ISA's point of view, I'm not necessarily advocating putting these things, these items in, in rulemaking, but I will say ISA's not necessarily opposed to it either, if that's what you feel like you need to do. Um, the exchanges already do these things. The trading firms do these things, most of them anyway, certainly. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we're already there. Um, we would, we would, however, I think we would very much draw the line from going any further than those words right there on those bullets. And, and, and to, to the po other point you were making of how do we know that CME sets the limit at X and the ICE sets it at Y? Um, I mean, first of all, I mean, from a, from a latency standpoint, a, you know, some type of check is a check is a check. I mean, what, what it, whether you're checking if it's higher than X or higher than Y, the effect on latency is effectively the same. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's not a material difference in terms of parameters that we would set. We may innovate and come up with, they may or we may come up with faster ways to handle price collar just as effectively uh, that may not be consistent with a prescriptive rule that was written two years before that. So I think in our view, we don't have a problem with that level of specificity. If you feel you need to do it, we don't think it's necessary, but if you feel like it's, it's needed, we would be comfortable with that, and we would, but we would we would certainly advocate that you not go any more detail than that. Peter, you had your hand up. Thank you. I was just going to make the comment that um, I think to Commissioner Summers' earlier question around how um, you know strictly do do the three constituencies um, currently apply or deploy these uh, these risk tools. I think the um, greatest variance. You, is possibly going to be seen in the FCM space. And, and that, what I was going to ask the question earlier, if the um, suggestions or these recommendations um, were that FCMs um, apply the pre-trade uh, risk tools, you know, separate from what the exchange um, gives us access to, because I think that, you know, in, in the U.S., the exchanges are very good. They, 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 uh, make available, you know, man actually it's mandatory. You have to go through on both ICE and CME. Um, it's like some, some other exchanges, BMNF is another example outside of the U.S., but you have to go through their, their risk packages to access the exchange. So it makes latency irrelevant, you know, at least at that level. Um, the, you know, but the, you know, to, to Gary's point earlier, um, you know, which I, you know, most of which I agree with, um, you know, we as, uh, you know, FCM employees both view our responsibility uh, first and foremost as protecting the house, protecting the firm. Um, and so we're going to do our due diligence to make sure that, you know, clients are, are deploying the, the, the right risk tools, have the right risk approach, culture, et cetera, um, you know, before we're going to sign them up. But there is, uh, at the FCM space, a lot of our competitors actually have a big commercial incentive to um, you know keep latency as low as possible and when when you're adding risk layers you know to the process that increases latency which hurts your chances um, you know of winning business from some of the bigger you know high frequency trading firms so I think that's where you see you know the biggest variance and to chairman Gensler's you know point about you know the race to the bottom I think that's where you know to some extent you've already seen a race to the bottom in the brokerage space 
um, you know, with brokers who are competing on latency only. In, in Asia, a lot of exchanges have no um, uh, 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 exchange hosted risk controls. They don't even acknowledge the practice of, of DMA of, or sponsored access. And so it's, it's really the wild, wild west. We tried to touch on that in the uh, FIA um, market access you know, risk recommendations paper a year ago. Um, and, and that was kind of the point, to put pressure on those exchanges to act more responsibly like CME and ICE um, you know, to provide exchange hosted risk control. So um, you know, we can all, because it's the right thing to do. But I, I do feel that, you know, for the most part, the, you know, or I, I definitely feel that the uh, risk control or risk management responsibility is shared across those three constituencies. I think the industry does a pretty good job generally, but the one space to probably look at is in the brokerage space just because, because the risk cultures vary so, I think, wildly, um, depending on who you're talking about. Thanks, Peter. I think in order to keep on schedule, we do have a Q&A at the very end of this, in which I expect we were going to deal with this issue and other issues associated with that. So write your questions down. And let's think about them. Uh, we'll leave them to the, to the final panel when we have about an hour to kind of go over this. I'm going to try to get back on uh, a little more on schedule. We're going to go to... Um, let, let me just, because I... I don't want to wait on this because what I'm, I'm hearing you all say is, trust us, we're, we're the industry and we're not going to do anything to ruin the industry. And that's exactly the same thing we heard on credit default swaps, that we're all responsible adults here and we're going to take care of it. Well, that is the reason why Dodd-Frank was passed because they've asked us as a regulator to come up with ways to ensure that we can trust you on it. and and. I'd like to see it be as as much of a regulatory uh, a, a regime that that uses the principle-based regulations rather than being prescriptive. Uh, but I'm not hearing you come back and say, "Here's how we're going to be able to do that without being prescriptive." You know, we uh, yeah, I trust you, and, and it, we didn't have it in the futures industry. But th you're giving us the same argument that we heard uh, under for the credit defaults. Actually, I, 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 maybe I'm hearing things slightly differently, um, and, and maybe there can be some refinement. I mean, certainly at the broker level, I thought that, uh, uh, and I don't don't ask me for the, the rule number right now, but I thought I was obligated to to maintain uh, risk management procedures. Um, what's that? There you go. Thank you. Um, and, you know, if, if the commission was to go forward and to say, hey, and, and, I, and I also want to address something that Jill had said a few seconds ago, but if as part of, of, of the guidance, well, obviously that, that rule was released a long time ago, but if there was an amendment to, the, to, to, to that guidance and it said, by the way, as part of those risk management procedures, you should be addressing different types of customers with their specific types of risk, among which are the high-frequency traders, that, that, that I wouldn't have an issue with that because I think we already do that. In fact, one of the concerns I, I was smiling when Commissioner Summers asked, you know, do all your clients um, or do all traders apply the same standards? Uh, well, I also just came back, as, as Peter did, from a trip to Asia. Uh, and when the Chinese exchanges very recently put restrictions on the amount of cancellations and they put some other restrictions out there to limit high-frequency trader, it had a big impact on the retail volumes. Okay. Uh, and, and that's the problem. The problem is, is when you start targeting one particular group, you concentrate on that, and you forget that other groups may share characteristics of that group. Um, and, and, and that's one of the things that we as brokers do all the time. We, we, we look at the risks of all our different types of clients. We don't care what they're called. We try to understand what they're doing, and we try to, to deal with the specific issues addressed by those types of trading strategies, et cetera. So if, if there needed to be refinement, certainly at the broker level, in the guidance as to what constitute, you know, what are the areas that we should, should, should cover in the risk management uh, procedures, I think that would be fine. I don't want to speak for the exchanges, but obviously, you know, the commission designates them as, de as contract markets. They, they, you know, uh, we'll see what happens in the CEF rules. There'll be an equivalent process. But it seems to me that that would be the appropriate place to talk about a condition of designation. Um, you know, so I think you already, I don't think it's just an issue of saying, trust us. 
you have some authority to mandate that we deal with this. What we're saying is leave it to us to figure out what might be the most appropriate way. And to follow up on the chairman's point, you know, it's no different than saying, um, yes, it's not trust us on speed limits. It's just that you know, an 80 mile per hour speed limit might work perfectly in Nevada on the big open highways. Uh, probably not too well in New York City. Commissioner Chilton, uh, do you have a question? Um, I'm going to save mine for the last, but if you have time constraints, just maybe, just go maybe ahead. one, Commissioner, uh, and a follow up on what Commissioner Dunn was saying. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of this discussion that we have on this and other things is uh, trying to figure out what the right balance is. And so uh, even when I talk about, you know, I think these are things we should be looking at, definitely we want to be careful and, and, and you know, dreaded unintended consequences. We don't want to have that. But there is a little bit, I think, I have some sympathy with, for what Commissioner was Dunn was saying. Uh, I agree we don't want to have static regulations, uh, particularly with regard to, you know, HFTs and algos. It's going to just change too fast. So we want flexibility. Um, I don't know that we go all the way to sort of a principles-based approach, but uh, we need some flexibility. But what I think we're trying to, to get at, and I hope this is the case for everybody, is that if something bad does occur, um, that we will be in a very reactive mode, and then we will probably overreach. And so now is the time to try to really get at the nub of what we need to do. And when I look at some of the recommendations, I start thinking, well, those are generic recommendations for everything. And there's not really anything specific here uh, for HFTs. There's a few, actually. But overall, it's sort of like, uh, well, we have to do this anyway, and nothing needs to be done specific. So I've just got one question, because I, I think there are some specific things that we need to, to look at. We were talk you were talking earlier, folks were talking about limits. And so say we have our position limits, for, for sake of just theoretical conversation, say we have a 10% limit of open interest in a market. Um, if you were talking to a commercial trader, um, I guess there's a theoretical possibility they would sell or buy 10% of the open interest in, in a day. But an HFT could theoretically you know, buy and then sell within 15, 20 seconds. Does that help the markets if they're buying and selling? And should that be something that's just okay to buy and sell many times, whatever the position limit is? I'll just leave it to that, Commissioner O'Malley, that one question. Does anybody want to respond to that? Well, just to be, just to be very honest about it, I think that's virtually impossible. Uh, to buy 10% of the open interest in a 15 to 20 second window is just, if you look at the size that we trade, you're talking about a fraction of the open interest nothing near that size. Uh, liquidity constraints would not allow you to buy 10% of the open interest in a market. And it just, just doesn't exist. And firms like ours, mm -hmm. if you go through and you look at the open interest that we carry, um, typically the open interest we carry is hedged. Uh, and, and depending on the open interest measurement, if, if there's any kind, if open interest has any size to it, our percentage of open interest is usually very, very small. If there's 200 contracts so open, yes, we could be 200 contracts. Commissioner okay. Chilton? So, so you wouldn't have any problem saying that you couldn't do it since there's no way you would do it, right? Yeah, you, you can't do it. Okay, good. Yep. I have an amendment, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, we're going to go to uh, the phone, Nick Garrow. Uh, is a head, uh, global head of electronic trading for New Edge. Uh, Nick has 17 plus years of electronic trading experience in the derivatives and equity markets. Uh, as global head of electronic trading, he oversees a team of 100 um, and supports more than 4,000 end users on more than 80 markets across all assets globally. Um, I think to understand what the challenges that these pre-trade controls are going to do and, and with the challenges of latency, um, I think Mr. Garrow can help us understand what it's going to take from a technology standpoint to implement these uh, um, goals and objectives that we've laid out here and, and <laughs> what seem to be articulated by some of the commissioners uh, to go further. Um, so we're going to hear from Nick and see what 
the art of the possible might be. Nick, are you there? Good off. Yep, I am indeed. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. And Scott, do we have a do you have a copy of the slides? Will you be turning the slides or? We have you on an enormous screen. Oh, everybody can see it. Okay. And your photo, you should be aware. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, but first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to try and keep this relatively brief um, in the interest of time. What I'm going to try and do basically is outline um, the current uh, practices that we have at UEDGE and also some of the challenges that we have um, with regards to uh, DMA pre-trade risk control. I know the focus of this particular meeting is on DMA, but I also want to talk briefly around SDMA, the sponsor of our Nick, can you hold on a second? We can't hear you very well. If you could maybe slow down and speak up. Okay. Is that better? No. <laughs> I'm looking for our IT guys. If you can pick up your handset, might be the recommendation. Yep. Can you hear me now? Perfect. That was our IT guy fixing it. Okay. So, um, yeah, my apologies for that. We're on uh, slide uh, slide two, Scott, just in terms of the uh, presentation overview. I wanted really to start off just by giving uh, a picture of the current uh, electronic trading landscape as we see it at, uh, at UEDGE. We have a very large client base. I know the focus of this meeting is on uh, DMA. Um, I also want to touch briefly upon uh, SDMA as well, sponsored direct market access, and some of the challenges there on the pre-trade risk control side of things. Um, I also then want to go on to uh, talk about what our approach is at New Edge uh, currently and moving forward in terms of how we're going to be better manage uh, pre-trade risk controls, both on the DMA and the SDMA segment. Um, and then finally, also share with you, you know, some of the, the, the investment the investment requirements we have in terms of uh, dollar spend, and also some of the uh, implementation challenges uh, we, we have as well. And I think, or I hope, um, that the presentation will draw together many of the things we've been talking about here. Um, I'm certainly not going to talk from a technology perspective. I'm going to talk from a practical and practitioner's perspective. If we could change or move on to slide uh, three. Can you see that? Go ahead. Yeah. So um, broadly, we, we see um, our customer base split into, into two bodies. Um, we have what we describe as uh, SDMA clients. These are customers that we are sponsoring uh, on two exchanges. And then we have DMA customers, and these are customers who are trading through our own trading infrastructure. Um, the, what I wanted to do was just briefly touch upon uh, the differences between these, uh, between these two cloud bases and also some of the challenges we have um, with both of them um, and what our current policies and procedures and practices are with regards to uh, pre-trade uh, risk control management and also um, where we're going in the future. I'd like to start off, if I could, with the uh, DMA customers, or in fact, a comparison between the two. So what's the difference in our world between a, an SDMA client and a DMA client? A DMA client is defined as one which is trading through uh, New Edge um, uh, trading infrastructure, over which we have direct, uh, exclusive, and uh, full control. For DMA customers, we currently run uh, a number of different trading systems and platforms, some of whom you're probably familiar with, TT Trading Technologies, CQG. We have clients trading through FIX. We have clients trading over PATH systems. So we support a wide range of different technology platforms. The key thing is that for each one of those systems and platforms, we have full and exclusive control over the pre-trade risk limits. And the limits that we can set include many of the limits actually we were discussing or you were discussing earlier on, um, which you recommended need to be set both at the clearing firm level and indeed also to a certain extent the trading firm level as well. So this focus here is on pre-trade quantity limits, uh, fat finger limits. It's also looking at uh, daily position limits as well on contracts by contract by maturity, uh, and by maturity as well. Um, on the DMA side, therefore, we have full access, we have exclusive access, we have full control. The types of pre-trade limits vary according to the specific system or platform we're using, 
but broadly speaking, the requirement is to be able to set um, quantity limits and uh, position limits as well. On the SDMA side of things, um, obviously we are sponsoring clients uh, onto an exchange. Uh, they're, tr they're, they're trading using uh, the uh, New Edge um, MPID or Session ID. Um, and the pre-trade risk management control uh, with these guys is much more of a challenge. What we do, and I think we've adopted to a certain extent some of the recommendations that have been laid out already, is we conduct um, due diligence on the, uh, on the trading firm itself. We've quite an exhaustive uh, questionnaire, um, and I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the names of the people who were speaking earlier on, but some of the questions that they were being asked by their, by their clearing broker or the FCM are typical of the questions we would want answered as well. So we conduct some due diligence on the, on the trading firm. We are looking or seeking to achieve clarity, clarification around uh, how or whether they have pre-trade risk controls in place, how they work. Um, we're also seeking clarity, uh, clarity um, around, from an architectural perspective, uh, where the customer's uh, technology is going to be located, uh, how obviously it's going to access the exchange, et cetera, et cetera. So for the, uh, for the SDMA customers and clients, we're conducting a piece of due diligence. We also have a minimum requirement within, uh, within New Edge that regardless of the answers to all of the above questions, we have to have the capability uh, to do four things. Number one, we need to be able to see the client's orders. That can either be through some kind of drop copy directly from the client or from the exchange. We need to be able to stop the client from trading. So that's the, uh, the sort of kill button that, uh, that's been mentioned, I think, uh, in, the, uh, in the previous um, uh, presentations. We need to be able to view, access, and have access to the client's limits and also to change them as well. So our requirements are relatively stringent. The technological challenges in doing all of that are immense. Uh, we have currently uh, a large number of SDMA clients trading, obviously not just US markets, but global markets, and across multiple asset classes as well. So my, my challenge or our challenge at New Edge goes, goes beyond just the world of, uh, <coughs> of futures or exchange traded derivatives and extends obviously into the equities world uh, fixed income world as well, uh, and, uh, and FX. Um, often clients will be running multiple connections into multiple exchanges and multiple markets. So the challenge there is getting a holistic view in as close to real time as possible in terms of what the customer is doing across multiple destinations. And I'm going to come on to talk about this a little bit later on. The, um, so those are some of the challenges in terms of uh, managing viewing and gaining control over risk management on the SDMA clients. On a post-trade basis, we're taking executions and execution reports into our post-trade risk management systems. For the DMA customers, uh, it's a bit more straightforward in the sense that because we've already got the pre-trade risk limits in place, the DMA platforms we use, typically ISV sorts of systems and platforms or FIX, provide us to a large extent with the visibility over uh, the customer's orders. They give us the capability to change limits, and frankly, they give us the capability as well to, to switch a client off and to stop them or block them from, uh, from trading. For SDMA clients, as I said before, um, all of the customers and clients are scored by the Operational Risk Department, and we conduct a piece of uh, due diligence on the uh, customer's trading applications and their pre-trade risk management controls. For DMA clients, because we have the pre-trade risk place in place, a greater visibility and control, then obviously we have to go through all the routing agreements and uh, a pre-trade limit uh, approval and, uh, and set up. The challenges, frankly, on, on both sides of these customer bases are quite enormous. On the DMA side, um, as many, uh, we're running multiple systems and platforms. Each one of them uh, can be slightly different. So in terms of manpower uh, and support uh, running these systems and platforms, it's, it's quite a large burden. To a great extent as well, uh, much of the limit inputting and processing is manual and it's not automated. It's a very difficult process to automate. So there's obviously um, the, 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 the possibility uh, for human error. Um, but broadly speaking, that's a quick overview in terms of the, uh, the environment currently as we, as we, as we see it. What, what comes out from me uh, from, from this environment currently is sort of um, three things, really. 
Um, given the range of customers we have and given the range of destinations they're trading and the range of asset classes, it's, it's a huge challenge to get um, proper pre-trade, real-time visibility over every single customer. Um, so one big thing for us that would help our lives and those of our clients, we believe, as well, is, is a better and more uniform consistency of pre-trade risk controls at the exchange level. And I use the word uniform and consistency uh, quite importantly because many exchanges have pre-trade risk management controls in place, but the way that they are implemented uh, is different. So when we're dealing with a customer de uh, trading uh, across three different regions or geographies, the challenge of, uh, of, of, of maintaining real-time risk, risk visibility over the customer is, is quite large. The second one, which I believe has been touched upon already uh, on numerous um, discussion groups, is the post-trade drop copy data. It's really important both for us and indeed for our customers as well uh, to go to the, to the Bible source uh, of executions and working orders, and we believe that is at the exchange level. So what we're looking to do is to take in, in real time, uh, both working orders and execution reports from all of our customers, particularly those who are going onto exchanges through the uh, SDMA route. But there is, again, a lack of consistency, um, particularly outside of the US, I have to say, in Europe and certainly in Asia, with regards to the quality of the uh, drop, co uh, drop copy data that is, uh, that's provided. Um, and finally, my third point on this is the, is the behavior um, that we would like to see more consistent across exchanges on customer and client disconnect. Um, there's a large amount of focus, quite rightly, on the pre-trade risk management side of things. There's also a large area of operational risk and systemic risk uh, when, when a high-frequency trading firm uh, disconnects for whatever reason from the market. As we've, I think we've noted, um, these customers and clients can be working a large number of orders. Um, if, if they disconnect from the market, the behavior we like to see is we have for cancels on disconnect, which are supported by the exchange at the exchange level. So to the greatest extent possible, uh, we, 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 we understand or believe that the client's orders will be, will be canceled. What is dangerous and risky is having multiples of hundreds, sometimes thousands of orders working on an exchange when for whatever reason the client has become uh, disconnected. So those are the three things, broadly speaking, if I looked at the current, some of the current challenges and issues that I would pick up upon is, um, is, is, is better and, and more consistent pre-trade risk management at the exchange level, better and more consistent quality of drop copy data, and better and more consistent uh, behavior on uh, client disconnects. If we move on to <clears throat> slide four, Slide four is an overview uh, framework uh, in terms of where we're going with our risk management and our risk management approach at, uh, at New Edge. Um, broadly speaking, what we've done is we've, we've split the risk management down into three uh, buckets, if you will. Um, all of these buckets are within New Edge, and I'm talking about controls within New Edge, and I'm not expanding this out into uh, either the um, exchange-based controls or the trading firm controls. So broadly speaking, we're splitting uh, risk into, into three pieces. We have the pre-trade uh, risk management. Um, this is obviously geared towards preventing erroneous uh, trades getting to an exchange um, and stopping a trade uh, actually executing or getting to the venue uh, if it shouldn't do. On the DMA <coughs> side of things, <coughs> the pre-trade risk management is provided predominantly by the different ISV vendors. Uh, we're looking at simplistic things here, really, but nevertheless uh, measures that, that prevent erroneous trades or a high-frequency number of orders getting to the market. So it's quite simply uh, quantities uh, per order, it's position limits uh, on, a, on a daily basis, and it is, where possible, also uh, the number of message or message throttles as well. <clears throat> for the SDMA, for the Sponsor Direct Market Access clients, pre-trade risk management is a big challenge. Um, obviously, I'm working uh, quite hard at the moment on the uh, SEC ruling in the U.S., uh, which effectively uh, bans uh, naked access trading, uh, as far as I can see, on, uh, on equities, equity options, and a, and a range of other instruments as well. So there's a huge um, challenge in the U.S. at the moment, which is to find a pre-trade risk management solution that will suit both the requirements of our clients in terms of speed, but also the requirements of the regulators in terms of uh, control, 
exclusivity of control and, uh, and access as well. If you take that challenge outside of the US onto some of the other markets as well, in Europe and, uh, and APAC, it's very difficult to find solutions and vendors that can come up with a, with a, with a very low latency pre-trade risk management solution that covers all markets and, uh, and all products. Um, finally, on the pre-trade risk management side of things, I think the, the other place, as I've touched upon earlier on, that we will be looking for some more conformity from is the exchange level controls. And we, we look quite closely at the degree and the types of pre-trade risk controls which are available on different exchanges, and we actually rank the exchanges as well internally according to the levels of protection they pro uh, provide to us, the FCM. Um, there's a great degree of inconsistency between the controls um, where we basically, as the FCM, as the clearing member, have to fill often the vacuum or the void uh, between the customer and the exchange. So um, getting this consistency of control, and as I say, this is not just a, a, a US problem. Um, this is a much bigger issue and problem in, uh, in Asia um, is, is a big issue for us. The piece we're really focusing on as well now is the, what I describe as the at-trade risk management. So the pre-trade risk checks should stop uh, an erroneous uh, order getting to the market. The piece we're looking at now is the at-trade risk management. Well, this, uh, what this is about basically is trying to get as close as possible real-time visibility over all of a client's working orders and executions. And it's an additional set of controls that we put in place which basically says, for whatever reason, if the client manages to get a trade through on a pre-trade basis, which they shouldn't have done, the ad trade should pick it up, provided we can get visibility over the client's working orders uh, and executions, and it will set additional alarms and alerts. We're building out uh, an ad trade risk solution at New Edge uh, globally currently, uh, which is focusing on uh, equities and uh, exchange-traded derivatives. Uh, the initial focus is going to be certainly for the uh, SEC ruling in the US, but also more importantly across all of our SDMA clients. What we're doing there is we're feeding in or we're getting access to all of the drop copies where possible from every single exchange, and we're putting them into a centralized risk tool uh, at New Edge. And the risk tool will provide us with real-time visibility of orders working at an exchange, real-time visibility over executions, so it gives us an additional alerting mechanism should there be an issue or a problem with the client. The important piece is the at trade risk management tool that we're, we're implementing can deploy what I call uh, pre-trade agents into the field. And the pre-trade agents consist of either full-blown pre-trade risk management controls on a low latency basis or cutoff switches and devices which would stop a client from trading an exchange if we detected on the at trade basis they were in breach. So it's trying to build a consistent global at trade risk view. To do that, we require very good quality and very fast uh, real-time fixed drop copies. Um, it's a large project. It's a complex project. The volumes of data uh, are enormous. Um, but we feel what we need to do is to bring this at trade visibility into the sort of, you know, the one to 10 second uh, time frame. So we're looking for a gap between the client entering an order and us being able to detect, detect it and pick it up in the at trade system of somewhere between one and 10 seconds globally. The post-trade risk management piece um, is, is, as the name suggests, a different thing altogether. The post-trade risk at, uh, at New Edge is looking at taking the clearing feeds in from the exchanges or from the clearing houses and running more complex uh, risk calculations over customer and client's positions. So maybe looking at stress testing a position or a portfolio, um, and the time delays involved in doing so are obviously longer. So this, this strategy here of pre-trade, at-trade, and post-trade is the sort of framework uh, w around which we, we are building our um, risk management controls processes. Um, it gets changed by the regulatory environment. It gets changed by uh, the micro-market environments as well. Um, but broadly speaking, that's what we're, um, we're looking to build out. Slide five is next. next. Um, yep. My apologies. Can we have you move to the challenges or a conclusion because we're running sure. out of time? Okay. Thank you. So we'll skip slide five. We're going to slide six. Yeah. Um, I think I've touched upon most of these points um, already. To be honest with you, um, the main challenges in, uh, or some of the challenges involved in implementing this, 
um, is, is, is around data consistency and what I call data transportation. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of data to, to move around between the different risk systems and between the exchanges and, uh, and New Edge. There's also the, the challenge around implementing these uh, low latency pre-trade uh, risk controls. We're seeing in the, uh, in the US with regards to the uh, equities markets, um, you know, a rush towards uh, single, micro, single digit microsecond pre-trade risk management. This is becoming a key commercial consideration. Um, and also, obviously, we have to keep track of uh, and keep fully mindful of, of the regulatory environment and how that's changing as well. Um, I was also asked to give some indication in terms of the sort of costs involved to implement these technology solutions. And that's the final piece of the, uh, of the presentation. So we're looking at you know, around four, four, five million dollars uh, to, uh, to set these controls uh, up. Uh, then between four and six million dollars to run, which includes the hardware, the software, uh, the market data reporting, and everything else. Um, and then also, more importantly, it's not just a question of building out the technology and the tools, but also having the right people in place to interpret what the tool is saying and also take the appropriate action around it. So, you know, we're investing quite heavily in people to support these tools and these applications as well. Um, I won't go into the uh, appendix. The appendix is just, uh, well, it's just, it's a framework around how uh, we're classifying clients and what controls we need to put in place at a pre-trade, at-trade, and post-trade basis. But I think in the interest of time, Commissioner, I'll probably um, stop there and take any questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for complying with our time constraints. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? This is uh, obviously a complicated uh, challenge, and I think as, as Gary DeWall pointed out, this is something they've taken on uh, on their own initiative to a, serve their clients and probably uh, meet the regulatory challenges uh, that they have. And if Gary, you want to comment on why New Edge has taken this step and and I, yeah, I think the the challenge, and I think the thing again is 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 again I I, I still sort of struck by Commissioner Summers' question it, is our clients often trade multi assets internationally simultaneously. Um, and, and when I do hear the discussion about possibly restricting trading in advance, I, I shudder um, because of that. Um, the problem that we have as a global broker, uh, again, is not just obviously complying with the U.S. requirements, but complying with the requirements um, all around the world and obviously uh, of, of sister agencies here. But I think the challenge to our customers is, is also very, very similar because, you know, obviously, from their perspective, to the extent that they're granted, uh, you know, uh, direct market access, or uh, as, as as Nick calls it, sponsored direct market access, um, you know, the lack of consistency internationally is very, very challenging. It's very, very challenging. Uh, obviously, your mandate here is the the U.S. futures markets. Um, our our issue and our clients' issues are are, are the global markets, um, and and the problem about being prescriptive in one place um, is that it could do a lot of damage internationally um, and 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 yes I, I'm very sensitive to the debate about rushing to the bottom um, I, I was sharing with uh, Commissioner Summers already about how as a global broker um, we already see the majority of our business being booked in the UK uh, not just a majority a substantial majority uh, almost to the exclusion of our other zones um, just because of the uh, of the environment and some of the things you can do in London that you can't do here in the United States so we would be very, very concerned about you know the CFTC uh, coming up with very prescriptive um, requirements for the markets here because we think it would be actually just very anti-competitive. Obviously, we don't want the U.S. to go to the standards of Asia, which in many cases are still being developed from scratch. Um, but you, this, the problem with these markets is they're just not in isolation anymore. That's the biggest issue, and that's the challenge we have. Nick is trying to create a, an infrastructure. Uh, that deals with the four asset classes that he discussed and and and, and the 30 plus markets that, that we provide access to so that it is a, it is an amazing challenge thank you we're going to go to the break um, and I come back in 10 minutes so 25 after and then I'll obviously impose on our next panelists to keep their presentations very tight uh, so we can continue to have this uh, discussion so uh, see you in about 10 minutes thank okay. you and Nick you can go home now <laughs> Thank Thanks. You, Nick. Thank you.
or entity has too much control on how data is exchanged or interchanged, otherwise it will become a barrier to entry and put new market players at a competitive disadvantage. It will also be too expensive for market participants to make changes as the market continues to evolve. In some ways, it may slow down the overall implementation for clearing. Standardization also helps make technology spend more manageable. Other benefits of standardization are it helps to reduce, it helps to reduce time and cost barriers for new entities to emerge as viable competition and for new market participants to enter. The second area of concern is the development of gateways to the CCPs such as the affirmation platforms. In the diagram, it's towards the center right. Care must be taken that these interconnectivity of these gateways do not impede new affirmation platforms to connect. From a client perspective, it is important that an affirmation platform connects to multiple CCPs and supports affirmation for multiple asset classes. For example, an affirmation platform should support both IRS and CDS so a client does not have to link and pay tolls to different affirmation platforms for different products. This will allow operational efficiencies and consistent workflow, reducing operational risk and trade breaks in the overall system. The third area of concern is the post-trade allocation that occurs within the investment um, investment management process. This is in the center of the diagram above. I cannot emphasize how important this is not only as an integral part of the buy side investment process, but one that requires more education and much more awareness as market structure workflows are defined. This continues to be an underinvested and underappreciated area as we write the rules and design the workflows for the new market structure. It is important to note an asset manager may manage many different money vehicles, such as pension funds, insurance companies, separate accounts, collective trusts, and many more. For many different client types, such as institutions, corporations, among others. It is just as important to understand that the complexity in this step comes from the fact that each client account or fund has within their investment management agreement constraints and targets that may include their choice of custodian, the counterparties with whom to execute, the potential clearing members that they choose, and other investment services. Let us, let us look at the next slide to see some more detail on this. An asset manager may have multiple investment strategies that are linked to many different client accounts and services. Take for example, in fixed income at BlackRock, we may have 150 strategies that span across 3,000 client accounts. When a strategy generates an investment idea, this idea is applied and distributed among many accounts. More often than not, it is, a, a, it is applied across multiple accounts. It is also worth noting that a key metric for an asset manager performance is the consistency of fund outperformance relative to the benchmarks and the stated investment objectives. It is very important as we design the implementation and sequencing of interconnectivity, the allocation of a block trade to client funds and accounts that legally own the risk is taken into account. And that ownership connection is followed through to the appropriate CCPs and the multiple FCMs chosen by the various clients themselves.
up until now, we have talked about technology interconnectivity. Client funds are brought into this structure via various legal agreements that authorize money managers and various service providers and vendors, such as CEFs, clearing members, to act on their behalf. This diagram is meant to represent the anticipated documentation that is needed to onboard clients. As you can see, there are many touch points that need client documentation. So if we want a smooth client adoption, these documents need to be standardized, simple, and keeping the overall process in mind, kept to a minimum where possible. The sooner we start the process of creating these documents, the sooner we will be able to onboard clients. These documents can be created alongside rule writing and implementation rather than waiting till the very end. We strongly discourage client documentation to be used as an excuse to delay or sequence onboarding of clients behind other market participants. Before concluding, I would like to spend a moment on sequencing and timeline. We look at this through three lenses. The first lens is infrastructure. We believe we start with clearing. This is where we believe the market has experience, confidence, and endorsement for adoption by most market participants. Over time, we introduce executing facilities and allow for market to gain confidence with the phased implementation into each of the respective areas. Once confidence is established, liquidity should follow. The second lens is market participants. Dodd-Frank promotes an all-to-all -all market structure. The only way to achieve an all-to-all -all with all market participants is to have them move in a lockstep together. Anything other is a perpetuation of the status quo and where we saw no client adoption. To design market structure for clients without clients is a flawed approach. A staggered onboarding of market participants will overall be more expensive and more likely the higher costs will be borne by the market participants that are brought on later. The third lens is product. We need market structure to develop simultaneously for multiple products. Otherwise, we will end up with vertical silos that are not designed to efficiently be used across more than one product. We collectively here are working towards a market structure that is durable and sustainable over a long period of time. Therefore, it is more important to have the right market structure that has confidence in it from all market participants than one that is put in place too quickly or too fast. In conclusion, to design and implement interconnectivity properly, there needs to be an understanding of the operating processes and respective workflows for all the constituents involved. And there needs to be a consensus and coordination among the constituents on standards. This will reduce operational risk, barrier to entry, and will make the overall trade process more conducive to adaptability and adoption as the market changes. On this last slide, we leave some overarching questions as takeaways for everyone. Again, I'd like to thank the Commission for giving us this opportunity to present our views on interconnectivity. Thank you very much, Saperna. Um, we're going to go to next is uh, Larry Tab is the founder and CEO of the Tab Group, a financial markets research and consulting firm focused on helping financial service firms, vendors, and technology integrators better understand and create their uh, technology visions. Prior to founding the uh, TAB Group, Larry was a vice president of Tower Group Securities and Investment Practice, where he managed research across capital markets. Um, 
Larry began his career at various operations in North American uh, investment at Citibank. So, Larry, uh, thank you very much for uh, participating. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the Commission for allowing me uh, this time to talk. Uh, Commissioner O'Malley asked me to talk really about the technology implications of Dodd-Frank uh, in the financial markets and really uh, what I focus really more on the, is the derivatives aspects of that business. We'll start pretty quickly with high-level workflows um, and then really look at the um, uh, across various entities, um, uh, how does it exist now what, and then what's proposed uh, along the SCF level, the clearing, dealers, prime brokers. Then look at uh, some estimates on what we think the dealers, the major dealers are going to be spending, uh, a little bit about dealer progress, and then some conclusions. And we'll try and go through a lot of the workflows pretty quickly. Um, we did a lot of this uh, work in uh, late summer, early fall. Uh, we interviewed uh, and talked with a lot of the interdealer brokers. We talked with probably 10 of the largest 15 uh, swaps dealers to try to get a good understanding of what technology is involved and what they're going to be spending and what are the challenges, and some of this comes out of that. So if we look at the existing market, basically the existing market is kind of built as almost a, a phone market and a, and a really way of taking end user risk, basically hard inventory minerals, uh, agricultural currency, interest rate risk, energy risk and then transferring it into the financial markets to absorb it. And to a certain extent, um, this part of the business we don't really think is going to change significantly as a lot of the end users are carved out at Dodd-Frank. The issue is developing a whole new market for you know, the standardized agreements that are really done mostly between financial institutions to a certain extent. And we think that's, you know, has, become is going to become more of a you know, traditional um, uh, exchange type market or, or an SCF or, or DCM market uh, and that's really on the right side of this uh, that's going to change. So to a certain extent we're going to wind up with an SCF and a clearing mechanism inter, uh, interposed in between uh, the two halves of this market, the, the existing market between the end users who are still trying uh, uh, to manage uh, inventory risk or financial risk. Um, and the right side of this, which is the, 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 the financial institutions trying to m manage risk on their own portions, but take risk in the marketplace. And the SEF and the SAFs basically um, meeting the two. So we, we believe there's going to be the large dealers are still going to wind up being interposed with the end users, um, trying to help them um, carve out specific uh, end user swaps agreements, and then taking gap risk and then leveraging that um, uh, through, the, through the SEF into the financial institutions. The financial institutions, we believe, will be broken out into a couple of different groups or, or working with a couple of different intermediaries, the large dealers or the dealers, clearing firms really representing smaller dealers and prime brokers managing hedge funds and prop shops um, interflow into that, into that market and all will be kind of uh, revolve into the trade repository and the clearinghouse process. The CEFs generally are going to wind up having a, a number of different types of infrastructure. Certainly, there, you know, in the upper left, there may be colo, depending upon how how uh, high frequency you know, this business gets. Certainly, there's going to be a connectivity part with managing um, uh, uh, information flow between all the different members and participants. There will be a credit management process, a pre-trade risk. Um, certainly, there's going to be a market data distribution process, a surveillance process, and at the core, a matching engine with drop copies, I think it was talked about earlier, going back to all the different participants um, and then linkages in with the clearinghouse. The clearinghouse is going to be a repository for offsetting a lot of this risk. Um, they're going to need a very significant risk management infrastructure, which is in the upper right-hand side of this. Certainly a cash management process to figure out where all the cash is coming from. Uh, a, a way of being able to compare all the transactions, basically take all the information in, uh, aggregate it, compare it to make sure there are no breaks, um, make sure that all the netting and novation works right, aggregating all the positions which then go into risk management. There's going to be a whole margin process uh, and a way of collecting all that margin that needs to be managed. Um, and that information is going to wind up going into uh, multiple trade repositories that may be located around the world. Uh, and then there's going to be a whole issue or um, uh, identifier management uh, issue that uh, is going to be a fairly problematic since a lot of these product products don't really exist now. 
uh, and and I think the, the next topic is going to you know uh, talk about that. The dealer uh, infrastructure, which is kind of going to be, uh, we think to a certain extent, the largest portion of the spend in this market. Um, is going to come really from basically building out a lot of the internal infrastructure because they're not only going to need to manage the existing process that exists today, but basically build out, you know, a lot of the primes live in the dealer infrastructure. They're going to need to build out um, uh, an electronic trading process. They're going to need to build out connectivity to all their clients, and their clients are going to, you know, be multiple types of clients from asset managers, hedge funds, insurance companies, prop shops smaller dealers, uh, any, and I'm sure some end users as well are going to want to partake in a lot of these tra uh, transactions as well. They're going to need a risk management infrastructure both on the pre-trade side and the post-trade side. They're going to need um, uh, a way of being able to interact with all the different regulators, the clearing houses, the clearing banks, the repositories, multiple, you know, SEFs, um, plus you, they've got a P&L. Um, uh, process and a margin process that winds up having to go across again multiple multiple entities around the world uh, and this is across different geographies as well as a, as a market data infrastructure that's, that's going to need to be managed as well. The primes will probably be more focused at the prop shops and the hedge funds. It'll kind of be a sub-segment. Um, it'll be really more around margin um, and just uh, and, and uh, interactivity. Um, and being able to basically aggregate smaller clients or hedge funds um, and get them into the right place and, and uh, manage credit. So we think that that we're looking at probably uh, uh, around a billion eight from the larger dealers that's going to be invested in building out a lot of this infrastructure. This is going to take place generally from last year over th uh, into 2012. And we think that it's going to be broken out into five or six different categories. The e-commerce side, which we're looking at really is the trading infrastructure, the ability to match buyer, you know, match, um, basically take positions within the organization um, uh, and be able to trade within the organization um, and market make. The low touch distribution channel, which is basically the distribution side of the business, which is building out all the um, Infrastructure that goes out to their clients, all the messaging, all of the risk, uh, all of the pre-trade risk, all of the the messaging standards, all of the um, uh, drop copies, all of all of um, um, you know the, the analytics, all of the the platforms that basically are going to go out to all their clients. Uh, the CCP infrastructure, basically, you know, working with all the different CCPs around the world, uh, trying to get them to better understand, you know, um, get them to link, be able to. You know, get all their transactions to the CCPs, get the output from the CCPs, being able to uh, manage all uh, the margin that's associated with that. Uh, we think then the next part is the risk side of the business, which is going to, which also includes a lot of the, the reporting, the data management, the um, analytics, the you know, looking at positions, managing, you know, um, managing the internal risk of, of uh, these firms um, and their clients. Then the collateral management side, uh, again, uh, a lot of that it's also margin and risk uh, as well, and be being able to manage all the collateral that's on on uh, uh, on deposit and and with uh, uh, the CCPs, and so, and then we think the bulk of this is going to be picked up by the top uh, four or five firms or three or four firms. Um, uh, it's going to be a fairly extensive load, mostly because. Um, uh, these firms are global. They're going to be trying to do this both in U.S. as, in, as well as in Europe, um, uh, and they're doing it across multiple asset classes. Larry, can I ask just a question on this chart? Yes. These top three or four firms, if you have an estimate, what do they spend annually um, uh, they on could, technology, I guess? The, the top firms on the whole investment banking side are spending in the U.S. four or five billion. Uh, a, a pop on technology. So four or five billion per firm. Per firm. And that's in the U.S. and internationally. Uh, it's uh, um, uh, two and a half times that. So two and a half times four is ten, and two and a half times five is twelve and a half. So ten to twelve and a half billion. Yes. So annually they spend ten to twelve and a half billion. And this is over three years. So this is over three years. So we're looking about fifty million a year, something like that, for the for the top firms. 50, 60 million a year spread out over three years. 60 million a year, and I know it's just an estimate. 
compared to their 10 to $12 billion technology right. budget. I mean, it's significant money, but as a percentage, it's Correct. somewhere less than 5% or around 5%. Could be around, yeah. Mm -hmm. that. The follow-up on, on that, it, then, is this, is this amount something that they would be doing under their ordinary course of business, or is this strictly as a result of Dodd-Frank? We think this is a result of Dodd-Frank because a lot of these products and services really wouldn't necessarily be needed because the market would exist the way it is, you know, today. When we look at that, uh, what U.S. broker-dealers are spending in the U.S. market, um, it's somewhere around uh, 20, 22 billion overall. Um, that's in the U.S. market again. Uh, globally, it's probably about two, two and a half times this. Um, uh, we think I, I should note, I, now I see that our $31 million a year, it wasn't has, just, it's, it wasn't just add, this group. You have to add the billion that the SEC gets to, you know, so. Oh, on technology, they don't have a billion on technology. No, they're not on technology, not on though, technology. overall. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a drop in the bucket. I might end up quoting you. Uh, in terms of growth rates, um, you know, uh, the growth rate of technology has been challenged over the last couple of years because of the recession, you know, uh, but we see it's coming back, but still it's not coming back at the growth rates that we saw, especially in the early part of the uh, 2000 uh, time frame, but it is coming back. Um, how firms are prioritizing their OTC derivatives initiatives, certainly it's client demand and regulatory compliance are the two big issues that they're really trying to focus on, uh, as well as uh, competitive differentiation and value-added services. So uh, the bigger guys are out there trying to figure out what their clients are wanting, trying to build it, basically. Um, where are they with their readiness? Um, out of five, most folks uh, that we talked to, again, late in summer, early fall, uh, felt that they were pretty good on the way to clearing and execution, a little less on reporting and compliance, um, and less and least on reference data. And reference data actually becomes a big issue in, re in risk management. When I mean reference data, it's all you know the the OFR stuff, all, all the issue about unique identifiers for securities, unique identifier for identifiers for customers. I'm trying to get all of their data uh, aligned within their organization, especially for products that don't necessarily exist right now. Um, and where are they in terms of uh, their product priorities? So what are they focused on? They're focused mostly on the credit and the rate side and much less on the commodities, equity, and FX side. So, uh, so the big issue is you know, credit and rates, which you know, tend to be uh, their bigger businesses. Um, conclusions, uh, dealers are absolutely scrambling to build out their capabilities. We think the top 15 guys are going to be spending about a billion eight uh, over, over a three-year period to comply with Dodd-Frank. Um, uh, while dealers have invested heavily over the decade, you know, decades, products, clearing, trading businesses, you know, distribution models, all are changing um, because of, you know, a whole new way of really looking at the swaps business. Um, while regulation is significant, um, client demand is really driving development as well. Um, uh, uh, and so clearing and execution of the key investment areas, and as I said, they're focused mostly on credit and rates, more so than commodities, equities, and, and FX. And with that? Larry, thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, this was some great slides. Um, Finally, we'll have um, uh, Bob Garrison is going to introduce his colleague with uh, DTCC. Um, and he, Bob is the Chief Development Officer of DTCC's Information Technology Division and responsible for all IT applications and uh, development efforts at DTCC. And he is also a uh, experience in uh, investment banking as well. Bob. Uh, good afternoon to the commissioners and members of the Technology Advisory Committee. Um, I'm here with Marisol Colazzo, who is uh, Vice President in charge of DTCC's uh, Trade Information Warehouse. Uh, we're here today to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities in helping the Commission achieve its objective around market transparency 
Marisol will run through the presentation and we're happy to take uh, questions on our experience and observations in working with the industry on derivatives transparency and data reporting. Uh, so as well, good afternoon um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, First, just a bit of background. Um, the Trade Information Warehouse is a subsidiary of DTCC, and it operates as an industry utility governed by its users. The warehouse provides a centralized global repository for OTC credit derivatives today, which includes both legal record keeping and centralized lifecycle processing. The warehouse has been in operation since 2006. Today, over 95% of the trades held in the warehouse are electronically confirmed. The remaining population, the paper confirmations, are reported unilaterally, unilaterally by the submitting party of the current, with the current open inventory and certain key economic details. The warehouse database currently represents 2.3 million contracts with a gross notional of 29 trillion. It is based on these types of existing automated processes that I will discuss today how we think the Commission can achieve one of its key goals on market transparency by leveraging those processes that are presently capable of producing high quality, robust, and accurate data in a timely manner. Based on such a model, the Commission would benefit as it is assured to receive the best quality of data currently available. To achieve these, there are four key points that underpin this premise. First is a coordinated technology implementation must take place across the entire industry. Second, mitigate the delivery risks where possible by utilizing existing robust, accurate, and auditable reporting processes. Third, the Commission should be indifferent as to the data collection process for the data elements required so long as the data is complete and provided on a timely and accurate basis. And fourth, standardization is necessary and useful, but by itself is insufficient to allow for appropriate and timely aggregation of data. Um, I'm really going to stay on this slide and just really hone in on each of these four points and, and, and get, provide some background. So with respect to point one, to ensure successful implementation of an SDR, there must be a coordinated effort with the industry in defining the framework for submitting these records. This includes defining the business requirements, reviewing the message choreography, connectivity points, identifying reconciliation tools where necessary, drafting functional specs, training, user testing, you know, some similar things that I heard earlier today about um, the ensuring that the firms can connect and that, they, um, that the testing is, is, is there. It's important to note that the industry, the buy side and the sell side, are taking these reporting requirements very seriously and have been actively engaged at the warehouse as an industry utility provider in discussions as to how they can meet their reporting obligations. We do not believe it can be successful without industry coordination, which builds confidence and momentum in a solution and overcomes uncertainty and ambiguity, which will lead to extensive delay. In this regard, the Trade Information Warehouse has kicked off several work streams to review the data attributes and validations needed, message choreography, and life cycle events. The response thus far is that most of what has been prescribed um, with respect to the data elements can be provided, particularly where automated processes are already in place. The key challenges that the industry faces is re in reviewing who needs to report what by when. And I'll talk more about that in, in, in point three. This is particularly impactful where data needs to be reported in advance of existing automated processes, in effect decoupling the reporting requirements from the automated process, and resulting in potentially lesser quality data being reported. Another key challenge is reporting of paper confirmed trades, as there are no automated processes in place due to the customized nature of these transactions. Currently, the sense of the working group that has been formed um, is to ask this commission to consider reporting of these trades to be satisfied through a real-time record submission with an image copy of the confirmation representing the fuller legal and economic terms. And, you know, and they have 
the commission to support an increase, excuse me, in electronic confirmation processes over time, an approach similar to the effort that the OTC Derivatives Supervisors Group has enforced with uh, major dealers um, in the past. These challenges lead into the next key point, which is mitigating delivery risk where possible by utilizing existing processes. The Commission would be best served by leveraging the existing automated process. For example, the key difference between the primary economic terms data and the confirmation data is the timing. The challenge to sending primary economic terms and confirmation data are not significantly different, and so it is not necessarily safe to assume that an accurate reporting process can occur that much faster than the current confirmation process. However, the degree of accuracy and the quality achieved through a matched confirmation are much higher than a unilateral reporting of primary economic terms. A confirmation record that is matched and agreed by both parties through an automated process ensures that the Commission receives data that is complete and accurate and systemically verified by both parties. With respect to timeliness for credit, rates, and equities, most trades are confirmed intraday. For interest rates, 80% are electronically confirmed within approximately 30 minutes. For credit, these trades are, are mostly confirmed within a range of 30 minutes to several hours following execution, and equities tends to be more within an intraday um, for standard contracts. I would say here, too, this has been evolutionary. Um, an evolutionary process where the industry has worked with its respective supervisors to improve the confirm timeliness by refining the existing operational process and standardizing where possible. Can I just ask, for rates, how long did you say? For rates, it's approximately 30 minutes. The Commission should consider monitoring these industry commitments as a measure towards improving the existing automated processes to improve upon confirm timeliness further bridging the gap between the primary economic terms and the confirmation data. It is also important to note that the regulator reporting has also evolved in this space. Based on the data access guidelines provided by the OTC Derivatives Regulators Forum, which is comprised of 40 regulators including the SEC and the CFTC, DTCC has launched the regulator portal. The portal enables regulators coincident with their authority to view trade level data as well as counterparty and reference entity exposure reports for the entities or jurisdictions over which they have authority. For central banks, they are able to view data for the largest financial institutions trading in that respective currency as a proxy for those institutions who are systemically important. For market regulators and prudential supervisors, discrete trade level data is available and that is updated on a daily basis. The feedback we've received from the ODRF has been largely positive from a credit perspective, um, and it's viewed to be fairly compliant. Um, more work is, needs to take place with respect to rates and equities to achieve that same high level quality of data, and you know, that continues to progress along um, in that, in that um, space. Um, Turning to point three, uh, as long as reported data con contains all the data elements and is reported on a completely timely and accurate basis, the Commission should be indifferent to the data collection process. In part 45 of the CFTC proposed rules, there are two different methods for how, how an SDR can review data, either snapshot or lifecycle depending on the asset class. DTCC propo proposes that the Commission should consider flexibility in allowing the industry to, de to define how data is collected in the SDR. For example, for electronic confirmations where automated processes are in place, it is much more likely that the industry would favor a life cycle approach, where trades are updated in the SDR based on the centralized life cycle um, updates to those records. Whereas for paper confirmations, the industry is more likely to favor a snapshot approach as there is little to no automation for these customized records. As to who reports, the Commission should, all, should allow for industry participants to identify the authoritative reporting source based on who has the best available information. For example, CEFs may not have all the information necessary to report the data elements prescribed in the proposed regulations. 
Also, foreign dealers may want to provide U.S. end-user reporting parties with the ability to report these trades to the SDR on behalf of the end-user. It is simpler to make the reporting parties responsible, and this clearly establishes a single point for control of data into the SDR. Swamps primarily differ from other products because of their life cycle events, and these do not necessarily occur in the same service as creation data. So coordination across multiple submitters is complex. DTCC thinks the majority of reporting should be done by dealers and DCOs, but it is not necessary to prescribe that a DCO reports life cycle events and a dealer intrinsic events, where the same process can likely report both. Turning to the last point, DTCC is supportive of universal identifiers for counterparty swap and product. Such standard identifiers will enable consistent standards for aggregation of data. However, in and of itself, it does not fully address the aggregation question. Timeliness of aggregation of data is key, particularly during times of crisis. In the wake of the Lehman Financial Crisis, it was well understood what the counterparty exposure, it was not well understood, excuse me, what the counterparty exposure was to Lehman as an underlying entity. The warehouse was able to provide such transparency by reporting the net notional, the potential amounts of funds transferred between all the counterparties based on the sum of, the, of their bilateral exposures. There is a great risk that with too many SDRs, this information would be fragmented and it would be too difficult for regulators to collect the data in a timely and accurate manner. Additionally, the process would be further frustrated as the sum of the net notionals on open positions provided by each SDR would not equal the whole. Today, the warehouse holds both cleared and uncleared contracts with up-to-date information, ensuring that in times of crisis, the regulators can view the aggregate counterparty exposures for their entire portfolio inventory. There are also additional benefits that the public, industry, and central clearinghouses derive from aggregation as it easily provides transparency as to liquidity and the depth of each asset class. There has been support for regulate, from regulator forms towards a centralized aggregation model as well. Both the ODRF and the Financial Stability Board in its recommendations on trade repositories urge that central aggregation of data is key and adopting uniform standards to allow regulators to access such data. Today, the warehouse already meets this through our current regulatory reporting, and we believe the Commission should look to preserve these existing processes where possible. Standardization is necessary, but not sufficient for risk reporting. Data needs to be aggregated on a timely basis, and this requires uh, an understanding of the data, of the aggregation process, and the consolidation of service for it to be efficient and evolve over time. In closing, I'd like to leave you with these final thoughts when considering these four key points. First, regulators can rely on existing processes to implement reporting procedures. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. There, there, are, there are existing processes in, in certain asset classes. Second, the market can evolve over time. The timeliness of reporting and confirmation will increase as market participants adjust to a new regime. Finally, regula regulatory transparency is also available with DTCC's electronic portal following ODRF guidelines. These capabilities can exist and provide regulators with valuable data now. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you very much. Um, as I indicated earlier, we're going to open this up for any questions on the first panel or this panel. Um, but I do have a question. Marisol, you mentioned on the swap dealer and MSP reporting versus the CEF. And right. You said there's greater fidelity of data with the swap dealer. Can you explain what the shortcomings of CEF data may be? Well, there's there's certain um, provision uh, d data attributes within the CEF um, that that the CEF may not hold itself. So, for example, trader IDs or desk IDs. It's certainly you know, a question of is that something that the CEF builds or is it better to have the reporting party directly submit it because it has all that um, relevant, if you will, static data information that it can provide directly to the SDR. The other point that I was making there is that you also have, far, you know, uh, foreign, um, if you will, um, swap dealers or dealers 
that also are facing off to U.S. parties. And in that instance, the U.S. party would be responsible for reporting. Um, and where that U.S. party is an end user, that end user, or th rather that foreign dealer may want to be able to submit that record on behalf of the end user. Can you speak to the universal identifiers and the challenges it'll take to integrate this and to have everybody here have yeah. an ID, have a counterpart ID, have a product ID, report that and understand that. Yeah. We've we've heard from several at the staff level and, and, and other meetings that this is an extraordinarily big challenge for the industry to implement. Can you go over some of the challenges you see? Well, certainly, um, you know, we, we think the standard identifiers is good. It is a challenge, in, um, and it depends on which one we're talking about. Um, you know, one, as far as the unique swap identifier is concerned, um, we, we already have a process within the warehouse where we identify unique ID. And so we think that to the extent that um, there can be a common language about how unique swap identifiers are, are provided, that we can uh, include that in the existing workflow. Um, certainly the choreography around how that unique swap identifier, where it gets created, how the reporting party gets that identifier back into their system, how do they ensure you know, these, these trades continue, there's a life cycle process to them, how do they ensure that they keep that identifier? Um, there, there are certain challenges in the, what we call the many-to-one process where you have a trade that's initially executed, then it's subsequently compressed um, or fully allocated. You know, how do you keep that unique identifier unique um, and, and following you know, the record across from, through compression? Can you talk to the time frames that DTCC thinks that it might take to implement this universal ID, and then maybe, you know, mm -hmm. Larry or Saperna, if you have some thoughts about what you've seen in the market related to this issue or the challenges you may have in, in case of BlackRock. Yeah. Um, it's hard to talk to the time frames particularly because we've essentially in our, in, in looking at our model to build the, the SDR, we're, we're putting it as a placeholder. So we know that there needs to be industry discussion on this point and identify a common, um, uh, method in which to submit the USI. Um, we're putting a placeholder for it, and in worst case scenario, we, we think that we have a way in which we can prefix um, those records so that we can use our existing I identifier and, and provide a prefix for it. So that's been our working assumption, but I'll open it up to Larry or to support to comment. When we look at the um, this universal swap identifier, I think um, you know one of the areas when we when a block trade is broken into the allocated components. I mean, in that in, in that um, in that area, I, we would expect that a unique identifier to be replicated, so that the the block um, identifier follows the different allocations. The challenge actually comes when we look at what do we do. Um, when we compress our portfolios, how do we how do we deal with the the identify in that case? Because we have to come up with the mechanism where the compressed trade and that swap identifier of the old package trades somehow reaches the the SDR and lets the SDR know that those trades have been replaced by the new compressed trades. So it's it's the second piece of it that is more challenging than the first. And that's actually a many-to-many -many problem. That's where you compress many trades. Yeah. Um, you take 100 trades, you compress it to 10 trades. What, what identifier goes with what? The next day, you compress those 10 trades into another you know, eight trades. So it's, it's a difficult audit trail problem as to how you follow that USI across compression. Yeah, and the compression is a very important uh, you know, piece of how we keep our books uh, clean and how we manage risk. Yeah, that, that's I guess what you know with the transaction ID, but it, but even in terms of the security ID, we have a hard enough time getting you know global unique identifier identifiers for equities, um, and then when you when you look with something that's not really even issued and you can be traded around the globe and different you know organizations, just the industry coming up with you know what is the swap and numbering it is just a really challenging issue, mostly because. You know, if we create our own unique ID, then you know, Germany decides well they well, they need to have their ID, and they create another one, and that's different from ours, and it has they'll have a different number of places, fields, and 
and then you wind up with having to create a table to say, you no, know, this ID is equal to that ID, and it just becomes a big, you know, pain in the butt. Excuse my language. Uh, just to answer, because um, there, there's another right, identifier, right, that's been um, quite challenging, the counterparty identifier. And, um, you know, here there, there was two things in the rules. One was about identifying the, the legal entity, the UCI, for the, um, the, the counterparty to the contract. There was also a reference regarding um, hierarchies and the uh, affiliate relationships. And so, you know, one, one of the things that the warehouse has been based on is, is identifying who that legal entity is to the contract. Um, when we think that from that perspective of looking at a way in which to uniquely identify the UCI for the contract is the right you know, process and it's part of what should be included in the submission to the SDR. Um, bigger challenges, we think, when you start to look at the um, affiliations and the hierarchies um, and gathering that information because, again, we're looking at this from a global repository perspective. These, these markets are traded globally. How do you get that information? How do you validate that information? Is it, you know, self-certification along with independent validations? Um, how do you ensure that that information is kept up to date? Um, much more difficult to do when you look at it from an affiliation um, perspective. But we do think that from a legal entity of the, of the contract itself, that that's something that certainly should be part of um, what the SDR provides. Um, before I ask a question, I just wanted to mention that as uh, excellent as this meeting is and as many people in the public are tying in, these documents will be on our website. I don't know if they are yet, but they will be on our website, all that you've done, which is terrific. And we ask really for the public to comment on the advice of the subcommittee, Dr. Gorham's subcommittee, but it, to, uh, as we did also in the Joint Advisory Committee. So you're not alone, you know, that we've asked the public to comment on reports that are given to us. And that all of this is also in a public record. I can't think of how many proposed rules have been discussed here, but to make sure we're complying with the Administrative Procedure Act, I'm going to ask that this entire transcript be put in the public comment record and be put in the right comment files. Certainly, I will have to speak only as one commissioner that I am considering those things you've said today in moving forward, uh, and, and it's very helpful to hear from the public. So I'm just saying that for the record. And, uh, I know my fellow commissioners are listening closely. Um, I did have a question uh, on the swap data reporting that we proposed in a rule said if it was bilateral, it was reported by the dealers. I think that's consistent with what you're saying. But yes. if it was on a swap execution facility or a designated contract market, and you know, I know it's not just you two, it might be others. Right. Uh, Tom, you all might form a SEF and so forth. We proposed that, and I think it was in some sense uh, a thought that it would be less burdensome. It's interesting to me that you would be suggesting yeah. maybe that you know, how, I don't know how many dealers there would be, but there are probably more dealers right. than there are SEFs. Right. Uh, and so we did propose that it would be the DCMs or the SEFs that would report the traded, cleared swaps. Yeah. It's that, to the extent that the SEFs really have all the information. I mean, that, that's really where, so I, I believe if um, the language was such that the SEFs would report and have the reporting obligation to the extent there was any information that was missing, the reporting party would, would provide that subsequent information. I think that was in reference to the UCIs, perhaps. Um, there's the concern that as a reporting party, they want to ensure that what's in the SDR is accurate, and so there's a reconciliation question there as to, one, has, has the stuff reported everything? Um, and if there is a gap, then how do I report that? And it's looking at the existing process and where do I, I build that into. So certainly the thinking is if the CEF is going to report, then the CEF has some work to do if there is a gap in fields. Um, and second, I'm going to have to ensure reconciliation. My, my, my other question it's, it's, uh, is to the extent that there may be multiple data repositories and the law 
allows. I know you're smiling because that means competition, but, <laughs> but uh, 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 the law allows that clearing houses themselves could register as data Absolutely. repositories. And certainly there are a number who have told us privately that they met, they're considering it. We don't know what they'll do, but they're right. considering it. Um, ha have you had any dialogue or do you have any advice for this commission who might have to aggregate data across multiple data repositories for our surveillance and compliance and other functions that we do? Uh, that's, <laughs> I mean, that, you know, that goes to the last point around standardization is good. The challenge that you have there is that the aggregation, in order to do that aggregation, you really need the granularity of the transactions. And, you know, what we, what we, we, we you know, specific examples, I think it's actually in our PowerPoint, um, speaks to if you took the open positions, an aggregate number by a clearinghouse, and you took the aggregate number of bilateral, and you looked at what the net notional um, is for each, and you summed that up, that's too high. You have to have the underlying detail in order to do appropriate aggregation. And so I think that's the biggest challenge for the commission is in having multiple SDRs, you then need to have that transaction level detail in order to be able to um, perform that type of aggregation. And, you know, our history of having developed the warehouse has been most of our spend, our technology, about half of our technology over the evolution of where we started from confirmation services through post-trade lifecycle ser um, services has been on that post-trade up-to-date, real-time, um, up-to-date record and aggregation. And that's been half of our well, technology. Maybe budget. I'll just leave my question there. Is any thoughts you have? Because the statute does not provide for unique swap data repositories. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, there's... Right. It allows for what may end, might end up being either multiple within um, an asset class or it might be geographically, there may be one in Europe and one right. here. So any advice you have? And then I'm just, you know, I think your names have been swapped, but you're Larry, oh. right? <laughs> Not so, but La Larry, just if you could follow up, because it would be helpful in our consideration on cost-benefit analysis and, and just all that we do here in terms of before we go to final rules, um, th this was enormously helpful. I don't have any specific questions, but anything further, as you say, um, detail on the costs. I was particularly intrigued when you said that these large uh, dealers spend 20 to 25 billion in aggregate here in the U.S., or individually four to five billion, and then you you said maybe they spend 10 to 12 billion worldwide, but. Um, I think as we continue to move forward, uh, we, we do recognize there's cost. It's a cost in relation to the, the benefits. That's how we have to do our work. But you could help us identify cost in relation to their aggregate spending and so forth. So. Well, we would love to help you, Commissioner. Well, let me thank all of the panelists. This, this was absolutely fantastic, and I, I especially like the diagram because it, it really tells me what's going on there. Mm -hmm. It uh, is, is extremely helpful for me. M my question is on the universal identifiers. Is this something that if the commission with the SEC task the industry to do, that you all can come to some agreement on this, or are we going to have to dictate something? I'll, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the industry is, is, is taking this very seriously, and there have already been um, discussions about how to broach, um, you know, both the unique swap identifier and the unique counterparty ID. Certainly, from a DTCC perspective, we are um, engaged um, with other providers to look at where we can um, provide such offering through our AVOX subsidiary. Um, so, you know, it's something that we're looking at, the industry is looking at, and there's, you know, there's, they're mobilizing around it. So, I wouldn't anticipate it to be something that the CFTC would have to prescribe, but. You, know, you have to kind of let the process, you know, go through and see where they get to. Uh, this is typically a pretty difficult challenge, um, but but I think that because of Dodd Frank and the OFR, 
I know Mike Atkins behind me, um, and I know that he's been working with the Treasury Department to try and tackle these issues. So I think that, you know, if it's going to happen, I think it's going to happen now. But they, it, it's been very challenging up to now to get the industry to come together on any type of universal um, identifiers. So hopefully it'll happen now, but historically um, the odds have not been great. I think that um, as far as uh, what what we plan to achieve by having the universal identifier, maybe some guidance on that would be helpful. But how it's defined um, and how it's implemented, the industry should be able to work that out among themselves. Well, Larry, you had made the point earlier that this is not just U.S., but it's worldwide. And so is this something that we really should look for the G20 or the FSB uh, to take the lead on, uh, to push for so we do have something that is worldwide? Um, I, I can't answer whether we should push at the G20. I'm not really familiar how that process works, but it's certainly that something that needs to be addressed globally. And, and if there's a way of doing that uh, through the G20, um, it might be worth bringing up, but uh, it's definitely a global challenge because, you know, the products are global and the counterparties are global. Is this something that we can move forward with reporting trades without having a universal ID, or if we don't go down this path of having a universal ID first, we'll screw everything up? I think if we wind up with multiple universal IDs, what will wind up happening is that there will need to be a way of reconciling them. And so it will either have to be done at the regulator level, certainly at the dealer level or the bank level, um, and then, God forbid, there's a, you know, some sort of fiasco, we're going to need to do it on a super national level. But it, you know, it strikes me that what Commissioner O'Malley's question is, is could we phase implementation? Could we, in essence, have requirements for swap data repositories and CEFs and clearinghouses, and they might come into being, you know, whatever uh, period of time. I, I don't want to yet predict, but, you know, it's phased in and they're there, and that that unique identifier may take another six months, 12 months, 18 months, whatever. You know, uh, uh, particularly I say this because Congress didn't say in the statute that there must be a unique identifier, but they did say there has to be a swap data repository. So I'm just asking, is there a way possibly, I think that's a question, to phase it, that we comply with Congress's mandate, that there are swap data repository, there is reporting, and then if it takes the industry a while to do that which Commissioner Dunn was talking about, uh, it's phased in. I think, yeah, I think you're going to have to phase it in. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be hard to agreement, but on the other hand, there are commercial benefits to owning the swap ID number. And so, you know, we've seen this with RIC codes, and we've seen this with any type of QCIP numbers or ISIN numbers or there there are benefits to owning the number. And so if I own the number, then somebody else, you know, is going to create another number because there's benefits to owning that number. Um, I, yeah, it, you know, and also I think there's that's that's true. And there's also the sensitivity to the um, per asset class. It's a, it's an asset class question, I think, as well. So that um, you know, to the extent that um, in the, in the warehouse we have for OTC credit derivatives a unique identifier. It's not as fully prescribed as the USI. There's some challenges, as we mentioned earlier, with the audit trail in compression, for example. Um, but there are some existing processes that you can look to um, with an asset class, perhaps as a phase in implementation as uh, the identifiers um, sort of start to form. I think, um, in, in, you know, in a phased approach, one thing that we need to be careful of is that we don't end up with the situation where we need to do back entry of the identifier, because that's going to be, you know, very, very hard and close to impossible. Um, I'd be real interested on to get any impressions from end users or clearing houses at the table here about some of these presentations about integrating all this technology and what what you're looking for, what you're thinking about, and have you even thought about some of these things that obviously the dealers and the and the exchanges of and new CEFs we're going to have to uh, move into. But before I do that, I want to check with, see if anybody on the phone, I, I understand there's more people than just Commissioner Chilton on the phone and see if they want to speak. 
uh, or have a question on any of this, or Commissioner Chilton, of course. Uh, Commissioner Malley, I just, I guess I just want to pick up on what Chairman Gensler was saying about, you know, phasing in, and, and law is pretty clear on certain things about when we are to implement things, but on a lot of it, we also have some flexibility. It says not less than 60 days after we promulgate a final rule. So, uh, you know, I'm a little concerned about uh, how we go about implementing some of these regs, in particular some of the stuff we're talking about now. Uh, I don't want it to be a competitiveness uh, problem for the U.S. Uh, if the timing is too short. So, uh, as the chairman said, uh, we'll, we'll look for comments, and, and this is very helpful today, but we certainly need to be cautious uh, as we go forward. But I don't have a question, Commissioner Romalia. Thank you. Um, anybody else on the phone? Um, any thoughts from end users or clearing houses about integrating technology? I would, uh, I'd like to just, uh, you know, for a generic company, um, and I'll use an energy company unnamed as an example, we presented a case study in an earlier white paper where we discussed our um, internal project before Dodd-Frank came along, but just trying to get to standard exchange product definitions, so exclude OTC transactions, but mapping our own internal systems to uh, the different exchange product definitions because all the exchanges have different product definitions as well. Um, so this was a fairly large team. It, was, uh, it took us nine months to map the first 60% of our transactions, a year and a half to get to the next 30%, and six months additional to get to the last 10%. And it only applied to standard cleared products, so this was well into a three-year project simply to map uh, you know, our own internal systems, and we had multiple over the years, um, to exchange product definitions. Um, so, uh, you know, and then you have the, the issue that, you know, across exchanges, you can basically have the same product, but, you know, all the, the data field uh, names, definitions are different. Um, and so you're, you're really spending a great deal of time just uh, for the same product ensuring you have consistency across the different exchanges. So um, we're now in the process of, of mapping OTC products, uh, but, you know, we're, we're looking again at a multi-year project. So I just say, you know, here we've been talking about global issues, and, you know, just to bring it back, you know, home to a, you know, one particular company, I don't think we can underestimate what it takes in terms of, you know, it, it's systems work, but it's it's process and just standardization of, you know, the, the definitions internal to a company. I think that's a great point. Um, one of the reasons we had this discussion, I think we've seen, um, this is some of the first slides we've seen from uh, at detail about how all of these boxes will be interconnected. And I think it's uh, uh, fascinating, I think I can speak for all the commissioners here, that you know, putting this all together, and I think the staff has been challenged to understand how the, all the parts will link together. So I'm grateful for your presentations today uh, that help us map that out. And I think we're going to, this is the first high-level discussion we've had on this, but I think to your point, you know, to take it to the next step and further on will be a, a great challenge and, and, and be informative to us to understand how all of these pieces will come together. I think that's where the industry is trying to put all our rulemakings together and figure out how all these parts come together. So I think uh, this this will not be the last uh, discussion we have of this, and I think it's a, a fascinating kind of look at where we have to, to go in the time that we have to get there. I, I actually sense while we put this on the website and ask for comment, there'll be a, we'll, we'll be <laughs> benefited and grateful for all the charts that are co gonna come in now that BlackRock and DTCC and, and Larry's group put together these charts, I just can't. Uh, I, I think we'll benefit, and we welcome the other public that put their various charts and, and comments in on uh, the mosaic. I, I did want to go back, at risk of opening up a can of worms, to the first discussion and the issue um, that we had at the May 6th event uh, two weeks ago 
um, the issue of order cancellation or excessive cancellation, um, some of this quote stuffing, it was equated to disruptive trade practices. And there were several of the Joint Advisory Committee members that spoke to that, to that end of saying that excessive quoting or excessive cancellation amounted to um, disruptive trade practices. Um, I thought it'd be helpful um, if we had a better understanding of what what's in place today to prevent that. And I think, Chuck, you, you, you briefly spoke about it in your earlier. And if you could make a brief comment and maybe, Dean, briefly talk about some of the controls that you have on order traffic and, and how you're going to, what standards you have to defeat kind of that disruptive trade practice. Sure. I mean, we have message throttles, which is a pre-trade functionality we've talked about a lot today. Uh, but on the issue of just uh, excessive quoting, um, you know, that's more of a compliance issue, and there's a policy around that. Uh, I think it's called uh, volume weighted ratio or something. And, and, and it, it was a simpler policy that we've recently made a little more sophisticated because we want to do two things. One, we want to discourage excessive messaging, but we also wanted to encourage tighter bid offer spreads. And so we actually, an order is not an order is not an order. Uh, an order that comes in that is, let's say, at or a bid comes in, at or better than the best bid, it gets a particular weighting. Uh, a bid that comes in that may be five ticks away from the best resting bid, it's going to get a much heavier weighting, a much heavier penalty and otherwise against that that volume ratio. Um, and so then, and we have different thresholds for each market depending on the nature of the market. Um, and then there are uh, penalties if you go over those thresholds. If you go over it, if you hit a certain threshold, um, it's $1,000 a day. Uh, I think for the, you get seven days in a month that you would not get on the eighth day and after you would get hit with $1,000. If you exceed an even more egregious threshold, it's $2,000 a day with no uh, waiver of any days. Um, so it's a, um, you know, we, we find the, the HFT traders to be, uh, uh, you know, not only want to avoid paying the, the penalties, but also being perceived as violating exchange thresholds, you know, whatever they are. So um, we find it to be an effective policy. I think we're, as I said earlier, we in the last year have been evolving that policy from one that was focused on our own system capacities to a kind of a more holistic view of, you know, what is a, uh, even though there may be amount of, uh, of, of messaging that we can handle, um, is, is some of it going to be deemed excessive in terms of ratio of fills to orders with this weighting in mind? And therefore, we may want to set thresholds so that some of that gets dialed back, which is what we've been doing. Dean, do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, at, at CME Group, we, we follow similar type procedures, but I think one of the things to just keep in mind is one of the things that we talked about in the context of May 6th were people's concerns about there not being liquidity, right? And as, as that market was moving very rapidly, that, you know, deeper in the book, we didn't have liquidity. So you want to be real careful about not discouraging messaging that's coming into to the marketplace, even though it may be later canceled. But we do two things. We have message throttles that basically test for a message per second. And if we exceed some threshold, we don't accept additional orders from that connection into Globex. And then we have a messaging policy that is basically the messages versus volume. So it's really about the quality of the messaging. And uh, similar to, to how ICE works, we work with our market participants if they don't correct their messaging behavior within the benchmarks that we set on a per product basis then we issue surcharges to those firms. Any other thoughts, questions? I'll get to you give me closing remarks, but no, I'll, I'll come. I'll, hold on. <laughs> um, I, I greatly appreciate everybody's attendance today, and I greatly appreciate the work of the subcommittee to respond uh, in, in a very short order to survey the market and prepare a report for us to consider here today. It, you're not relieved of your duties. Um, the subcommittee is not going away because I think it's going to have an important role in our rulemaking process and uh, identifying the best practices, which I would note uh, came from the industry uh, in the first place. And you, it was the industry standards that we worked off of. Um, we're obviously interested to see all other standards. And obviously, the, we want comment on this report and, and input from the public and some additional thoughts to see where, uh, what other 
standards we might um, uh, follow up with. And I do have some further questions about integrating, um, you know, all of the FIA proposals and why we, you know, what we resulted in this in this study. So I'll follow up with that myself. Um, but I greatly appreciate that, and we'll definitely follow up with you going forward. And I'm, I'm sure some staff will, uh, and our rulemaking teams will have some questions for you as well. So I greatly appreciate your help. Um, and let me just open it to the other uh, commissioners here to make any final comments. But let me thank everyone again for their outstanding presentations and uh, participation here today. Thank you. Um, I, let me start by thanking Commissioner Amalia for having put this all together. and. Chris and Laura and Adrian, who I know that probably don't get a lot of attention, but who I don't even know who's got all the efforts, but uh, and Shanice, right upstairs, Shanice for and Shanice <laughs> upstairs, organizing all yes, of that. Uh, but it's three very able uh, councils, and um, and all of you, the pre-trade uh, risk functionality, I think, will be very helpful for us and. Uh, I know that uh, I'm going to direct it go into the uh, various comment files on designated contract markets and swap execution facilities because we've asked questions about pre-trade uh, risk safeguards and your thoughts on it are very uh, helpful. Uh, and then on the other three reports, uh, enormously helpful. They'll probably go in a lot of comment files, but even beyond that, um, in terms of implementation phasing and the overall mosaic of our rule writing and the mosaic of related to the costs uh, are enormously helpful. And to the extent the public uh, wishes to comment on your comments, uh, we look forward to that as well. So thank you all, and thank you, Commissioner Amalia, again. Commissioner Dunn. Let me echo the chairman's uh, remarks on the thanks, Scott, to you and your staff for putting this together, but for the, uh, the subcommittee and the, the committee as a whole, this has been very, very valuable for me. Uh, and I would uh, ask the public to comment on the report that was given, but also on this meeting in general, because here again, this is influencing us as we go through our decision-making process. Uh, I was most taken, uh, Larry, with the, the $1.8 billion uh, amount that is being going to be spent on the technology and the chairman's $31 million that we have on technology. And I, this is something that this committee and the public has got to help this commission on how do we make sure that that $31 million isn't tail isn't wagging the $1.8 billion dog. <laughs> well, it's actually greater because the U.S. industry spends 20 to $25 billion per Larry's per year. I mean, not that we need to do that, but, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're actually this year, unfortunately, we're down to less than one-tenth of one percent of that because we've unfortunately had to cut back on the $31 million, so. It's even greater than that because a lot of this is for telephones, fax machines, and toner cartridges. Uh, that is true about our number, but I didn't know what their number was. But you are absolutely right, Commissioner Amalia. We spend all too little to actually fulfill our mission in an industry that, in the futures industry, has about 11 or 12 million trades, uh, contracts a day. Uh, the swaps market that we're about to take on doesn't have that many transactions a day, but obviously its volume in terms of risk and complexity is much greater. I didn't mean to start a debate, so <laughs> I thought we were agreeing. <laughs> Commissioner Summers. Uh, I just want to echo my colleagues in thanking all of you and, and want to say that as we continue following these very important issues on direct market access and pre-trade risk functionality that I find it's really impressive how the industry has um, with its in itself um, keeps raising the bar on complying with best practices and and where we are compared to where we were three or four years ago with these issues um, I think is very impressive so thank you all for being here Commissioner Chilton 
Uh, just real quick, and I don't want to o open anything back up, but it, my, my takeaway, and, and perhaps uh, Dean and Chuck will want to email me a, a nasty gram on this, but um, it seems to me sort of more is, is, is needed. I mean, we, if we have all this messaging going out, and if you all are already penalizing folks, uh, it seems to me that maybe the fines aren't working or need to be greater. Um, I do want to commend everybody. I didn't get a chance to talk about it too much, but about this study uh, from November that I highlighted in my opening remarks. It, it's uh, entitled, Where is the Value in, in HFTs? And it's uh, by a couple uh, uh, fellows in, in Spain, uh, Cartia and Penalva. And uh, anyway, I recommend it to people. It, it, it's interesting reading, and uh, uh, I'm hopeful we can look into this a little bit more in the future, uh, Commissioner o O'Malley. Uh, I did notice that as we were uh, in our meeting now that the uh, Congress looks like they're going to pass their the CR and we'll have funding for another couple of weeks. But I echo what all my colleagues have said earlier about we, we can't regulate the swaps market, the OTC market, without an increase. And if we end up being cut, we can't regulate the markets that we have jurisdiction over now. So thank you very much for all of you being here. And, and thank you again, uh, Commissioner O'Malley and your staff for your excellent work on this. Thank you. Commissioner, if you would uh, send us the um, email of that report, we'll put it on the Technology Advisory Committee webpage. Will do. Thank you. Thank you very much for everybody's participation here today.